afternoon, everyone. We are now at one of the high points of the festival and what, what will be seen from now as one of the high points in children's literature in India. We are here now to start off the book award announcement. This award was conceived as a way to recognize high quality children's literature from across India, literature that leads to a fuller understanding of India, Indian lives and Indian stories. For the book awards, we have nine award committee members who did the task of reading many, many, many books. They are here today. I will be welcoming everyone. Um, the award committee members, I would request you to come up on the stage and take your seat as I tell your name. Maya Tyagarajan. Maya began her teaching career with Teach for America, where she taught at a public school in Baltimore City for two years. She went on to teach high school English at some of America's most prestigious independent schools. After a decade of teaching in the US, Maya moved to Singapore and began teaching at the United World College of Southeast Asia. That's Maya Tyagarajan. Rasila Huja. Rasil has been a passionate reader since the day she discovered a library. She worked in technology for 10 years before making the leap into a classroom. Her passion for education, combined with a love, of, love for stories, inspires her to write for children. Her first children's book was published in 2017, Rasil Ahuja. Nadine Bailey. Nadine is an experienced teacher librarian with a demonstrated history of working in the IB environment following innovative practices. She is passionate about diversity and enhancing a multicultural, multilingual environment. Nadine Bailey for you, audience. <laughs> Katie Day. Katie is an American who has lived overseas for over 30 years. She has a master's in children's literature from the UK and teaching and librarian degrees from Australia. In 2017, she moved to Bangkok to be the secondary teacher librarian at NIST International School after 12 years in Singapore at the United World College of Southeast Asia. That's KT Day for you. And now, our very own Colin Kelman. <laughs> Colin has been a teacher at International School for about a dozen years. He has taught English and Theory of Knowledge. He has never stopped reading children's books and is partial to poetry. <laughs> Duleka Raj. Duleka is deeply committed to expanding cross-cultural understanding and intercultural dialogue through empathy. She holds a doctorate from University of Cambridge and her work for and her work focuses on India and its diaspora by addressing mobilities, global citizenship, tolerance, immigrant infrastructure, and the nation state. That is Zuleika Raj for you, audience. We have three more jury members. They're not here with us today. That's Geeta Vardarajan. Geeta has worked with children all over the world, earned her master's degree in literacy education from Columbia University, and now teaches second grade in Princeton, New Jersey. She is passionate about using writing meaningfully to make people more reflective. Let's give her a big round of applause, even though she's not here. <laughs> Anuradha Ruhil Barua has extensive experience teaching in IB Diploma. She is passionate about languages and teach, teaches English and Hindi. Her goal is to help students grow as readers and individuals by creating a collaborative classroom culture. Let's hear it for Anuradha. Our final jury member, Jeremy Bullitt. Jeremy is an innovative international educator with 22 years of experience. He offers students hands-on differentiated instruction that is fun, challenging, technology-rich, and connected to students' inquiry. He's a teacher librarian, elementary and middle school, and loves sharing his passion for library literacy 
and language with students. A big round of applause for Jeremy, please. Now over to Maya. Hello everyone and welcome to the Neve Award Ceremony. The Neve Book Award recognizes outstanding writing that leads to a fuller understanding of India, Indian lives, and Indian stories. The award spotlights stories that offer Indian children reflections of their own lives and experiences. It also invites children around the world to explore and better understand India. We hope that this award will encourage and promote Indian children's literature globally. The award winners are chosen from a short list of literature that illuminates a changing India. The authors give voice to India's evolving characters and the challenges her children face. Publishers across India submitted titles for consideration. An independent jury, that's us, shortlisted these using a rigorous process followed by a detailed read and discussion of each book. The criteria include the quality of the writing, interpretation of theme, development of plot, portrayal of characters, crafting of setting, and the presentation of the book. After months of deliberation, the jury has selected award-winning books in the following three categories. Picture books, young readers, and young adult literature. It's a great day for Neve. It's a great day for India. And I have the privilege of presenting the first award. Our young adult category was filled with remarkable books. The jury would like to recognize two books with an honorable mention. First, we'd like to recognize Ella, written by Sampurna Chatterjee, published by Scholastic, and What Maya Saw, written by Shabnam Minwala, published by HarperCollins. <laughs> And now, for this year's winner of the Neve Children's Book Award for Best Book in the Young Adult category, this year's winner is an engrossing read that will keep you on the edge of your seat. It's com a compelling story that invokes belief in destiny and belief in oneself. The writer skillfully manages to, com to convey complicated nuances of power and greed in a sophisticated yet accessible narrative. The Neve Children's Book Award for the category of young adult books is given to Queen of Ice, written by Devika Rangachari and published by Duckville in 2014. We invite the author and the publisher, if you're here, to come up on stage and receive this award. Um, for somebody who talks a lot, and my friends can vouch for that, I suddenly find myself bereft of words because I really wasn't expecting this. And it's a huge honor. Thank you so much uh, to all the jury members, to Neve, to Kavita, to everybody who loved this book and has taken and has spread the, the story by word of mouth. And um, I just don't know what to say. I just hope to keep writing um, more books, particularly on historical fiction, on powerful women in history, and put women back in the historical narrative where they belong. Uh, for now, I think I am going to celebrate with a lot of chocolate. Thank you so much. The excitement continues. Our young readers category had books with unlikely heroes. They took us on really, I mean, thrilling and nail-biting adventures. Some of these adventures were closer to home, offering us an opportunity to become heroes in our own imaginations and of our own lives. The jury recognizes two books with honorable mention this year. Timmy in Tangles, written by Charles Mahajan, published by Duckville. 
and Tiger by the Tail, written by Benita Cuedo and published by Scholastic. And now, of course, for this year's winner of the Neve Children's Book Award for Best Book in the Young Reader category. This year's winner explores themes of great importance to today's children, animal conservation, and environmental sustainability. If you don't believe me, just turn to the fourth or fifth grader next to you and ask them. The pressures of these are further complicated by poverty and power. Sounds like an adult read, and yet it is not because the author creates a voice and characters that speak to today's child in a language that the young can understand. Today's winner is Tiger Boy by Mithali Perkins, published by Duckbill. Mithali is not with us today, but Devika is going to accept the award on her behalf. Yes, Duckbill. Through Devika is accepting the award on her behalf. <laughs> Last but not least, in the picture book category, we had several strong contenders. The jury would like to make honorable mention of two wonderfully imaginative books. Catch That Cat, written by Tarani Vishwanath and illustrated by Nancy Raj. And also Amachi's Amazing Machines, written and illustrated by Rajiv Ipe. And now, for this year's winner of the Neve Children's Book Award for Best Picture Book, this year's winner is a thoughtful book that raises many interesting themes, including gender equality, land rights, and the cost of urbanization. The author and illustrator together present a complex theme to young children in an accessible manner. They have crafted a strong protagonist with an authentic voice in an evocative setting. The Neve Children's Book Award for the category of picture books is given to I Will Save My Land, written by Rinchen and illustrated by Sagar Kolwinkar, published by Tulika in 2017. We invite the author and illustrator, if they are here, to come up. If not, can the publisher come up? very happy that uh, this book has won the award. It is a very special, we're very happy that four of our books had been shortlisted. And this is a very special book and uh, deserves a kind of uh, attention the prize will give it because it's a very different theme for a picture book. And there are, um, Rinchen is one of those writers who, um, who, who writes uh, with such sensitivity uh, knowledge, because she is close to the theme she is writing about, um, but she is a, a brilliant storyteller to begin with. So, um, uh, which is the strength of these books? Sagar did a wonderful job illustrating this book. He was interning with us, and um, yeah, uh, you know, was willing to try different styles. And what he came up with. Um, being a, a book about land rights and land, saving uh, this little girl wanting to save her land, was uh, so um, appropriate. It just captured the whole, um, uh, the whole uh, uh, setting so well um, without having to make too much of anything. And uh, very well deserved and really happy on behalf of uh, um, Rinjin and Sagar and Tulika. Thank you. Three cheers for our winners. Hip hip. Hooray. Hip hip. Hooray. Hip hip. Hooray. Let's do this together. Yo, yo, yo. Louder, Neve. Come on, you can do better. Yo, yo, yo. yo, yo. Neve is having a show. Neve is having a show.
Everybody is having a show. Yo, yo, yo. Yo, yo, yo. Where else do you want to go? Where else do you want to go? Author talks. Author talks. Panel discussions. Panel discussions. Book exhibitions. Book exhibitions. Book rewards. And book rewards. Yo, yo, yo. Yo, yo, yo. What else do you want to know? What else do you want to know? Neve is having a show. Woo! Again, three cheers for the book award winners. Hip hip. Hooray. Hip hip. Hooray. Hip hip. Hooray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So we move on to our next section. A few weeks back, Neve had a beautiful assembly on inclusiveness. The grade five students performed a few role plays to make younger children understand the concept. The concept was linked with a few important values in the preamble of the Indian institution. Justice, freedom, fraternity. Our next session is all about the topic of finding oneself. Uh, the next per person we have. Yes, and talk about in it's inclusiveness. And there's no one better than the next panel moderator, Maya Tagrajan. She has spent 17 years in teaching and first in the US and then later in Singapore. She's a global citizen and has seen the differences between the Western and the Eastern approaches to education. She's the author of Beyond the Tiger Mom, East and West Parenting for the Global Age, a book on how to blend Eastern and Western approaches to parenting and education. Please welcome Maya Tagrajan. While researching on our next guest, I came across a page which said, a quick look at Chintan's CV. I'm still wondering what was quick about it. Here's someone with abundance of knowledge and experience. So how come the CV can be a quick read? Well, let me try to make it a little shorter for us. Well, as the founder of Friendships Across Borders, Ao Dosti Kare, an initiative to promote friendship between Indians and Pakistan, he automatically becomes a walking, talking encyclopedia on inclusiveness. He has also conducted uh, consulted with Clab Group, a social enterprise that connects international travelers to local classrooms for a rich cross-cultural exchange, celebrating diversity and oneness. Please welcome Chintan. One of the representatives, okay. Chintan is apparently in the author lounge. The author lounge okay. Can you please guide him towards tent one? <clears throat> yeah, while he comes, we'll move on to the next uh, person who'll be on stage as a panelist. The Penguin Digest says that our next panel panelist writes about food, but that does not mean that she likes to cook. She only likes to bake. And yes, she hates weekends as she cannot write peacefully. She says that the best thing about writing is the freedom. The idea of creating an entirely new world where you can get lost for as long as you want. Imagine having the freedom to be part of whatever you want without any inhibitions. Please welcome Andalib. Welcome. May I request the guests to please come and take the seats in the front. There are many seats which are uh, lying vacant here. Please take a seat in the front so we can start off while Chintan also arrives. Hello. And one more, final, uh, one more panelist of ours who's going to be on stage today is Ritu Vaishnav. She runs a children's bookstore that actively works with schools to build a strong reading culture among students. Ritu wears many hats. She's been a teacher, a feature writer, reporter, news producer and book editor. When not working on books, she likes to escape in them. Could we have Ritu on stage, please? So welcome, everybody. It's so nice to have everyone here. I wanted to start by telling you a story. And then we will get into some questions with our wonderful panelists today. So as you know, I was a teacher for many years. Um, and last, a couple years ago, when I was teaching in Singapore, I had a wonderful uh, student who was Indian. Uh, he was a teenager, about 15 and a half, 16. And he came to me one day and he said, Miss, I want to talk to you, in, you know, confidentially. Can I, can I tell you something? I need to talk about this with somebody. So I said, of course, you can tell me. And he's a very intense student, a voracious reader, lovely, lovely uh, child. And he said, I think I'm gay. And I don't know what to do about it. I can't talk to my parents about it. This is absolutely not accepted in my own family, in my own community. Um, I know they won't accept it. I know they'll be hurt, they'll be angry, they'll be upset. I don't know what to do, but I need to talk about it with someone. And I need, if possible, 
to read about it. He was a child who loved to read. So I, I was thinking about books for him. What book could I give him as his English teacher to help him know that he was not alone, to help him know that other teenagers had had a similar experience? And I was trying to find the right book. There, were, there are books, I think, about uh, young boys who are wrestling with their own sexual identity. But I wanted to find a book set in an Indian context which would somehow mirror his experience more closely than some of the Western books that were out there. And that was hard to find. So I have a question for the audience. How many of you have ever read a book that has a protagonist, a book set in India, with a protagonist that is either gay, lesbian, or transgender? Anybody? Yes? And I think now we do have, in fact, on our long list, we had a lovely book called Talking About Muskan, which was about a lesbian uh, a girl who was exploring her own identity um, and was, you know, had a very traumatic time uh, dealing with that. But one of the things that we're going to talk about today is who gets left out in literature, right? Do we have books for all our children, that, it, that uh, books that reflect the experiences of all our children, and do we have books that allow all our kids to empathize with people who may have different experiences. Books that will create empathy for those from different communities or different backgrounds. Books, you know, I, I would hope that we'd have more books that I could give that student of mine when he asked me for a book to know that he was not alone as an Indian teenager who was wrestling with his own sexual identity and trying to come to terms with it, knowing that his family would not accept it, right? Um, so today we're going to be exploring that whole idea of who gets left out in literature and why and what can we do about it and as parents and teachers and writers and publishers, how can we begin to change that narrative and discussion? So, um, I want to start by asking a broad question to all our panelists. We're going to start with the idea of who gets left out. If you had to say which communities you think are most underrepresented in literature today, which communities would that be? Who would you like to see written about more often? Okay, um, I really haven't given much thought to, the, to this, to be honest, because um, I think things now are opening up and people are recognizing that there is a deficit in literature for certain communities. And um, I'd love to see what all is happening. You know, I think publishers in India are much more, um, I don't know, of course, abroad also, but publishers in India are opening up to the possibilities of uh, different communities, uh, not just, you know, uh, representing uh, different sexual identities, but also religious communities. Different communities, people are opening up. There's a variety, there's a huge uh, number of, amount of literature that's coming out, and I really applaud the publishers for taking this on, and... Um, I hope to see much more. I really am not able to pinpoint any one particular thing. Maybe uh, something might strike if, you know, based on what Chintan and Ritu have to say. Right. Uh, I might go on about this for a little bit. <laughs> because I, let me talk uh, from the perspective of somebody who owns a children's bookstore and who is always looking at getting a wider variety of children's books for our bookshelves. So, and going through children's catalogs. You know, I think the Indian... Uh, publishing for children is still in its very nascent stages as compared to the way it is in US, UK, in the first world countries. We are still coming up and there are a lot of fabulous publishers uh, who are doing a great job. I know Duckbill is doing a wonderful job of um, bringing forth and talking about issues that aren't written about. I know Tulika, Karari Tales, so a lot of Indian publishers, you will find characters that you don't see in a lot of other books. But I think these uh, publishers are also really small right now. So you can see that they are putting their thought into bringing issues forward, bringing less represented communities forward. But we have to wait for them to grow as well. So I think we are at an exciting stage where publishers are thinking about it. Among the issues that don't get represented enough, I think I will not uh, say a particular community or um, differently abled children or even the LGBTQ community. We are seeing books happen. You know, we are seeing that happen. But the things that I don't see enough of, especially from Indian publishers, and I'm seeing that with the uh, books coming in from UK and US, a lot of mental health issues. 
that is something that I haven't seen uh, the Indian young adult novels write about. So a lot of mental health issues, we need to start talking about that. And another thing that I figured out while I was reading a book to my son, it's a lovely book by Neil Gaiman called Fortunately the Milk. And you know, it starts with the mother going out for a conference and the father has to take care of his family. And I thought, the way when my son was reading the book and I thought, well, here we'll have another fumbling dad who doesn't know what to do and the adventure will talk about how he figures out and you know. But the dad knew what to do. So that is not where the story was going at all. The dad was totally spot on. He knew what his responsibilities were and that's not what the story was about. So the story was not about a mother who works and a dad who knows his way around the house. It was just incidental to the story. So I'd like to see that normalized in our stories. You sensitive boys, dads who participate at home, the way we portray our men. And when the story is not focused on that, that's just normal in our story. So that's what I'd like to say. That's something I want to build on as well. I think uh, children's books ought to address toxic masculinity a lot more. There's so much uh, conversation going around, especially when there are instances of rape that you know one should work more with boys and men when it comes to gender sensitization. But I think um, the NGO talk is not going to work by itself. We need to have all of these issues addressed through children's literature because they happen through stories and they happen through feelings. And that's when there is a real connection with people who are reading. Um, I would also like to build on what Andleep shared about the different faith communities. I think I haven't come across any children's book that has a child who is Sikh or Buddhist or Jain ever. I have come across books that have children uh, from Muslim communities, but again, very few. I think Mukund and Riyaz was the first one that I came across. And I, um, I mean, there are more. I am not aware of all. I'm just uh, sharing what I remember. I think um, it's, uh, you know, seeing someone in a children's book is a way of acknowledging that you are part of our society and we see you. When people are absent from books, it's a way of saying that you are abs we don't see you. We, you're absent from our view of the world. And, um, that said, I would like to say that children's literature is filling in a gap that children's textbooks leave. Because if we look at school textbooks, none of what is happening in children's literature is actually happening. The fact that we look at issues of disability, gender, sexual orientation or preference is happening in children's books. And I think we must also applaud publishers for what's happening so far. It will take time to do things. Um, who gets left out? I think certainly trans people and non-binary people. I don't know any book uh, that addresses these issues. Yes. I think you're right, there, are, there is a change happening and you can see publishers being more courageous in terms of the kinds of books they're writing and the communities they're writing about, but it's still in its very nascent stage. We still don't have that range of books yet, right? I want to come back to the idea of, of faith and writing about different religious uh, protagonists from different religious backgrounds and different communities, right? I think this is a particularly important issue in India today. Um, and we need to see that representation of all communities, particularly communities that might be marginalized um, or discriminated against in the media or in society. So I have a question for Andalib. You write about Muslim protagonists in uh, you know, Muslim communities in India. And I wonder, as a writer, do you feel compelled to sort of combat stereotypes in the way you portray your characters? Do you feel this weight of representation of a whole community on your shoulders because there's so few books? Your books become the story that starts to represent uh, um, a whole community, right? Um, and I'm wondering how, how you feel about that. Does... Uh, to a certain extent, yes, you know, I do feel that way. Uh, that when I'm writing, so initially, maybe in the early days of my writing, I had that feeling like, like as though someone was constantly standing at the back and watching over what I wrote. That feeling was there that, okay, I better not stray into this area, I better not. So there's a lot of self-censorship uh, initially, you know. But I think as I started writing more and um, I started, I think I stopped caring more about what my community would say and, you know, it's, it, I think I wanted to, showcase things in a way uh, like like we talked about normalizing that is so important you know I don't like um, I wouldn't like to write about my community or people of my religion in an exotic manner which others us you know which is I, I don't even see how we're talking about this because you know we all are from the same country and you know 
equally, uh, I think it's, it's just the sad state of affairs that we have to talk about this as an issue separately. But I try to normalize uh, teenagers and their experiences. So when my first novel, Kai Strings, was uh, written, it was about a young girl who was trying to find herself, her way in the world. And her being a Muslim was just incidental to the story because I got readers writing and saying, this is what we went through, this is what we went through. So the, the teenage angsty experience is universal, you know. But I wanted to showcase, I, it wasn't something that I was doing with any lofty ideal in mind, thinking that this is me representing my community. It is what I knew and what I wrote. So now I think less about that and I write what I feel like writing. <laughs> Just once again, uh, I'd just like to introduce you. Uh, we have Janvi Burua as well, who is a part of the, uh, this group. She just walked in, so can you please have her as well. Yeah. Welcome, so, Janvi. Yeah. Janvi is the author of Next Door and Rebirth. And uh, just, I'll let you continue. Okay. Um, and I know you've worked with uh, um, editing as well, right? And publishing. Do you feel like there's a sort of self-censorship depending on uh, the communities you're writing about, your writers are writing about, things like that? Is that an issue? Uh, that so the books that I mostly worked with were non-fiction. Mm. So obviously, we, I didn't see much of that. But um, I think sadly, the times that we live in, uh, I think there's a greater responsibility to um, maybe be more responsible with your words. Mm. You know, you do not want to perpetuate stereotypes. You do not want to stereotype a category because, you know, sometimes even when we are talking about somebody who doesn't fit into a stereotype, we tend to stereotype the non-stereotype. Right. So the rebel, the girl who's rebellious is stereotyped. Right. You know, the girl who likes to play, uh, maybe doesn't like girly things is also stereotyped. So she can't like, like princesses and sports. She will have short hair. A boy who has specs will be in our book as uh, somebody who reads too much, right. you know. So uh, even in our non-stereotypical characters, we tend to stereotype them. So I think there is a responsibility on our shoulders as well to think about the characters that we are writing and think about why we are writing it. There is no reason, like Andaleep said, if I'm writing about a story about two friends playing together, and I, I don't see why their names can't be Parth and Hysim. You know? Right. So why are we just choosing the names that we are choosing? Mm. So as editors and writers, I think we also need to think about it. Why did we pick these two names? Why can't it be another name? Why can't this boy look different in this story? Why have I chosen this image? So I think especially now, yes. it is a responsibility for all of us to, as children's writers particularly, to think about why we are sketching the characters that we are sketching. And maybe can we do something different? Are we perpetuating a stereotype? A writer writes what she or he knows best, is most comfortable with, and feels the most for. So at least in our initial writings, you'll find that um, it's a lot of what we um, are about as people. So it's not a conscious thing, it's a slightly more underground thing. Right. So obviously, uh, I'm going to write about, in the long run, in the end, about very universal things. Relationships, people, deaths, loves, longings, betrayals, friendships, ambitions, jealousies. But I'm going to set it. Uh, in a place that I know uh, a lot more about than something I don't know about. So it's not that conscious really, Maya. Right. So it's not that militant, it's not that um, strong a choice. It just comes a little bit more organically, I think. And um, I know there are people who consciously like to take a position and write to a conscious audience, but I don't know how it's going to work in the long run. In the end, you write about who you are. Right, and you would end up sacrificing perhaps truth, or, you know, if you, if you are so... So concerned with the audience so and the stereotypes, yes. definitely. Yeah. Um, it is, it's an interesting uh, conversation. I know it's been had by you know, African-American writers, different writers around the world, like how much responsibility are they supposed to feel for how they represent a community that's typically underrepresented. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about gender as well, since so many of you are interested in gender and write about gender. Um, and I know in India, of course, gender is a, a huge issue. Um, Ritu, you've written a lovely book, Pink and Blue. I'd love to have you talk a little bit about that and how you would hope that parents and teachers could use that book to talk about gender issues and, and educate and sensitize not just our girls but also our boys. I think, um, I think that's very important. Yeah, so I was asked a question about, uh, in one of the interviews, I was asked, why did I choose to write the book? Because I have a son. 
So most of the people discussing such issues, which I thought was a very strange question because A, I'm a girl and B, boys need to talk about gender and, the, and gender stereotypes are as damaging to boys as they are to girls. So I wrote this book when my son, he was about two and, he start, and his favorite colors were pink and blue. And when he started his play school one day, he came home and he said, I don't think I can use anything pink because pink is a girl's color. So I should not use pink. And I felt really bad about the self-censorship, the feeling that he feels like he needs to give up something that he likes because it doesn't fit in with the world's uh, or with his peer group's understanding of his gender. And it was surprising that I too, kids can feel that pressure. They can start understanding gender stereotypes and they can start censoring and editing their own personalities to fit into those gender stereotypes. So I wanted to talk to him about it and having a children's bookstore, I, my first thing was to try and find a book on it and I could not find one. I went through a lot of catalogs, national, international and I was surprised that this is the age where it begins and nobody's talking to them. Why are we waiting till 15, 16 to start talking about this issue? And then I also realized that it's a complex issue to bring down to the level of a child. So I wanted to talk to my son about it and that's why I wrote the book and I feel, I really hope that this is a conversation starter. You know, you talk about it and then you ask your children. So when I do workshops in school, it's very interesting to see the things that they have built as gender stereotypes. Like yesterday I was talking to some five-year-olds and apparently nature and rain is for girls and snow is for boys, is what I was told. So every bunch will have you know, these, these ideas and it's so important to talk to them about it. So when they mouth a stereotype, don't put them down, don't dismiss it. Talk, ask them why they feel the way they feel and then offer them an alternate view. We need to do that. I'd like to hear from Chintan a little more about educating our boys. Because I do think, I mean, I'm a parent of a son and a daughter and I do feel like, as you said, we tend to talk about gender a lot more with girls and about girls and it becomes a kind of women's issue or girls' issue, but actually it's very much a boy's issue too. And I, I think as parents and teachers, we have to think a lot about how are we raising our boys? What are the books they're reading? Um, do they read enough books with female protagonists? Do they read enough books with sensitive boys? Um, you know, that challenge ideas of masculinity. Chintan, I know you do a lot of work in this area as well. Would you like to speak about it a bit more? How should we educate our boys? So I used to be a high school teacher. And uh, this question is really exciting for me. Um, I find that a lot of boys get sexually active in middle school and we don't have books that address that reality at all. Because of which we don't have conversations about consent. So there are people who are sexually active but don't understand consent. And there are girls and maybe in cases where boys are bisexual or homosexual, um, you know, they're male partners who they don't know how to respectfully engage with. So that's something that was not available to me when I was a student, and even now I rarely find books discussing stuff like this. And even when we talk about sexuality, I think we're typically focused on lesbian and gay protagonists, but what about uh, people who are asexual, people who are polyamorous? Um, those are realities that we haven't considered, even bisexuality, because there's this tendency even within the queer community to think of you know, bisexuals as the outliers who don't want to commit to anything because basically they want to have fun with anyone and everyone who's available. How do we address this? I think um, talking to Muskan does make an effort in that direction, yet the protagonist who is attracted both to boys and girls is quite wary of the word bisexual because of the stigma around it. So I think that's something to think about. Uh, as far as boys' experiences are concerned, I think we shouldn't think of masculinity as something that exists outside every other reality. So what about the experiences of Dalit boys, for example? or Adivasi boys, or um, so the intersectionality aspect is what I'm talking about, right? Masculinity is not the only identity. How does the caste identity, the religious identity, the sexual preference, everything intersect? We can't imagine that, if we, we typically say, that, right? Like these are boys' books and these are girls' books, but there are so many boys who don't feel seen in the boys' books. They might not be macho, they might like certain colors, they might want to spend their time not doing sports, so, all of that. Definitely. Um, and Janvi, would you, I know you also explore gender in your books in, in many different ways. 
how do you think parents should be talking and teachers should be using literature to talk about and sensitize both our boys and our girls to start thinking more critically about gender issues? Um, um, taking on from what um, Chintan said, it's very interesting about a woman's book and a man's book. So this, uh, my novel Rebirth, it's about a woman. It's a woman's um, struggle to find herself, be herself. And it got shortlisted for something called the Man um, Asian uh, Prize. And um, there was a shadow jury in Australia. I didn't know they had the shadow jury concept, but in, um, they uh, pulled in reviewers from across the world. And um, even before the main jury could award a prize, they went through the short listings and the long listings and they gave a prize. And um, the very interesting thing was someone said, oh, on the jury, this is a woman's book. And immediately the other jury members came back and said, what do you mean? What are, what are men be men topics, just because this is about a woman? Uh, so all books about war are men's books? We're not gonna read them then. All books about politics are men's books? I mean, there was a big outcry about how can you slot a book as a woman's um, book or a man's book? And we, we of course have very senior, senior writers, we all know who, who talk about um, women's writing, distinctively women, distinctively men. I mean, how can you slot it in um, that category? Um, so for, for young people, I think the best thing to do would be to talk about a book on its merits. To talk, like I said, when I'm uh, writing, I'm not consciously writing as uh, someone from the Northeast. In fact, I've lived mo most of my life, more than half my life outside the Northeast. I've been in Bangalore for 26 years. Uh, yet I write about Assam because that, that's DNA, the food, the culture, the dress, the behavior is from there, right? But um, I find myself writing a lot about Bangalore now. So what am I? It's just that I'm writing where I am, I'm writing what I'm um, exposed to, I'm writing what, I'm, um, what I love. So I think you judge um, topics on their own merit. And the sooner we teach our kids that read a book about war, it's not a man woman's book, read about war. War is something you need to know about. War involves a lot of uh, psychological dynamics, a lot of interpersonal things happening. Read it, tell me what you think about it. It's the way I taught my son, he's 17 now, and that's the way I address his reading and writing. Wonderful. Um, so one of the things that uh, I'd like to continue to talk about here with different communities, you were talking about how you went from writing about Assam, which is your heritage, to writing about Bangalore, which is where you live. And I wonder with diverse books, is it um, possible, is it encouraged? How do you feel about someone writing about a protagonist that is perhaps from a very different context from themselves? So I know um, when I was teaching in Singapore, for example, we had lots of conversations about cultural appropriation. So when someone writes about uh, a Westerner writing about an Indian protagonist, for example, um, how do you feel about that? When it, if, if we wanted to have more diverse literature represented, do we need people from those communities writing? Or can anyone write about a protagonist that might be from a marginalized community or might have a, a have experienced discrimination of some kind? I think there could be someone from that community writing, but they may not have the imagination or the writing skills. So just because they are from that community is not a qualification for it. Simply, also, similarly, if you're a great writer, but you don't have the sensitivity, the research, the ability to inhabit the experiences of that community, and you're just writing it because, you know, it's sexy to write about a certain community at that time. That is very disrespectful. I, I, um, that said, like before I pass on the mic, just wanted to quickly say that we don't see experiences of refugee kids being represented at all in children's lit. We have refugees from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, um, Burma, so many countries, and we have not a single book about their experiences. In, in India, published here. There are outside of India. Not in India. I, I think uh, I Dougville published this book called Wanting More which was to do with this. I'm not sure, I haven't read it, but I've read the gist of it. So I just wanted to add about this uh, cultural appropriation thing, which I think is very important um, in, uh, in the way that, you know, uh, I, ha I fully agree with what Chintan said, you know. So it can't be disrespectful and like, it's, it's not like, you know, we, I, I don't think anyone can write about anyone in a way, at least not anymore, you know, because uh, I think our world is so, um, we are emerging with so many new different, I think the, earlier there wasn't vocabulary, wasn't evolved enough for different experiences that people have. That uh, now that you know, people are understanding what the situation is and I definitely don't think that uh, someone from a Western or supposedly higher uh, 
what do you say uh, uh, situation in society can you know uh, effectively talk about a marginalized community because they wouldn't have the right context you know i mean there is there is no uh, you can't really experience something entirely no matter how much you look at it from the outside you know so right. but that said i think it's nice to have you know it's it, it can't just be token appreciation you know like token uh, like a lot of films you know there would be one token muslim fellow who right. will raise the jhanda and die you know so which is not make, doesn't make any sense right right absolutely um you know i think it's about perspective now given that you're being responsible and given that you're writing about something because you have something to say and not just because it's something that should be or it's sexy to write about that being given i think there is room for different perspectives there is the perspective of the outsider looking in and then there is also the perspective of the insider looking within and i think there is room for both those perspectives given that there there are fabulous books on india and hinduism written by westerners as well so there is room for both perspectives i think and that's a very dangerous territory when you say that one side cannot write about another side then where do we draw the line then men can't write about women right. or women can't write about men's issues yeah. so we can't really draw that line right yes chanvi did you want to add anything to that uh, just this idea of could a non assamese person write about assam could a you know as a hindu can someone write about a muslim is it do you feel like that you have a strong feeling about about that i kind of take off from what ritu said it's um kind of dangerous to have that final line about who can write about who why why can't a man write about a woman why can't a woman write about a man and when you bring it down to as final line as assamese non assamese or northeast non northeast um i think i'll go a step further and say if it's a non assamese who's lived in assam all his life and knows assam as well as anybody else there can definitely write about it it's about being authentic what about the assamese who lives in new york and knows nothing about assam is she or he qualified to write about assam i, I don't think so um, i mean he can make himself or herself qualified but just by virtue of being assamese um, doesn't qualify him or her to write about assam right so i think it's as long as you um, have the knowledge and the feeling and um, some sort of um, you know, you've been in that atmosphere there's some sort of osmosis through your skin i think you can very well write about these things just one another point about inside outside a very interesting point because i think that's what's relevant to today more and more and more um, you talk about refugees Uh, no one's written about refugees but in a sense all of us in the metros today are part of that experience and um, i kind of have a very um, very clear position on this because uh, i'm an assamese who's lived three fourths of my life outside assam yet deeply rooted deeply conscious of who i am yet i've lived um, in delhi calcutta gujarat kerala bangalore the uk everywhere and the, the least part of my years have been spent in assam So I'm in that unique position where I go to Assam. They're like, "Oh, you're not Assamese enough. Oh, you cannot. Uh, you haven't read this book. Oh, you don't know how to cook that." And when I come out of Assam, I said, "But you're not. Um, you don't speak Hindi that well, and do you speak Kannada?" So I've always been that bridge, and it's so interesting. It's fun sometimes to uh, have this mirror that uh, in Assam I'm not Assamese enough, and in uh, the rest of the mainland, what they call the mainland, I'm I'm a northeasterner to them, right? So um, I think increasingly that line is getting blurred. all of us who made bangalore home i think feel that we may be from wherever but we are bangaloreans now but that wherever still remains so we are always this insider looking out and this outsider looking in and somewhere i think we are negotiating our own space and finding that balance now and um, you talk about we were talking about um, a friend of mine about um, uh, how to write about belonging non belonging and the most beautiful thing i think is instead of being really um, strident about things what we're talking about today books films textiles food food is such a great uh, bond uh, these things are like slowly and steadily and very assertively making their way into um, uh, people's lives and actually blurring these lines um, one small very interesting anecdote i had uh, about 10 years ago i was on holiday in coog and uh, i get this call from somebody in mint saying be doing this celebrity chef special can you give us your favorite assamese recipe i said oh my god number one i don't cook that much but i can give you tanga fish tanga which is uh, like butter chicken for punjab you know so fish tanga and the person says no 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 not fish tanga that's too common anything else i'm like my goodness if fish tanga is common on the national landscape we have integrated i mean the the lines are blurred so 
I, you know, I, I just to uh, think, I, I clarify. You know, I don't think a lot of these experiences come under cultural exchange. You know, and they're not really cultural appropriation. What I was talking about was a, you know, a larger community. You know, writing about a marginalized community strictly in that sense. But I agree with all what you were saying. You know, about men writing about women, and ob obviously all that is, of course, you know, it's different. Uh, and there's like food, like you talked about food. Food is a great leveler, and also. Um, uh, one of the things that is also the reason for all this that 's happening in the country also at the moment you know at the same time so there's a there 's a wonderful side to it and there 's also a very dark side to it so you know there are things that you have to think about um, and it's it 's wonderful that we 're having this conversation so wonderful um, so what i 'd like to ask you all at this point is if you could change one thing or add one thing to children's literature, if you could give publishers and writers one piece of advice, if there was one thing you'd want to see more of, right? We're talking about who's left out. We've talked about the LGBTQ community. We've talked about um, a lack of religious diversity, refugees not being represented enough or their stories not being told. If there was one thing that you'd like to see more of that you feel strongly we need to be talking about much more, not just, you know, through books in our classrooms, I'd love to see books used more in our classrooms as well to discuss these issues. What would that be? So for each of you, what would it be? Janvi, do you want to start and we'll just work our way this way? I think Maya, definitely uh, for me, a um, um, little bit more about the margins of the country, a little bit more about books from the Northeast and especially children, the wonderful folk tales, the wonderful um, legends uh, from the Northeast, which can be very easily incorporated into um, novels, fiction um, from that area. A little bit more attention there. But having said that, um, I think because I've been on this inside outsider bridge thing for many, many years, um, I think that really the key is to um, celebrate your roots, celebrate, um, it sounds cliched, but uh, diversity, but um, know who you are, yet also really reach for the commonalities, you know. I think increasingly if you get uh, too polarized and try to just um, push one particular region or position or um, situation, um, it can lead to something, it can lead to a bit of confusion, I feel. So, I mean, hey, we're all here, we're all in Bangalore, we all enjoy this, but then uh, I also do this at home, and what do you do at home, and can I come across for Eid next year, you know? That sort of talk may sound simple and cliched, but somewhere it works, you know, I feel. Uh, I really, I can't think, you know, of uh, what I would want uh, publishers to focus on because we've already talked about it so much here. You know, they came up with some amazing things like, uh, like Ritu talked about mental health yes. and, you know, which is really important. And um, because in India, there is this whole tendency of, you know, the, the, it's, it's, I think, like, like I said, you know, the vocabulary has evolved to an extent where mental health and talking about it is a different, uh, I think it's a different landscape than what it was 10, 15 years ago, you know. So those are important and we've already talked about it, you know. I think Chintan talked about so many important issues and I, I mean, um, I really felt like my mind, my eyes were open listening to them. So I'd give it to them to t continue. Uh, if you allow me, I'd like to uh, tell a little story about why we need to have different characters or diverse characters. So when I was about 10, uh, that is the time when I became a little conscious about the fact that my nose can be a, a source of great amusement to my classmates, you know. And uh, at that point, and then I had these uh, really long legs and hands and uh, a lot of relatives. Well, there was a relative whose daughter was on the heavier side and we were all supposed to be very sensitive about that. And I think, but nobody thought much about... Uh, calling them matchsticks, you know, so they used to say every time during every family gathering I was told that, oh, your limbs look like matchsticks, you're too thin, you're sickly thin, you look sick. So those were things at 10 that I was hearing. And then at 10, I discovered this lovely book called Little Women. And there was this character who remains my, one of my most favorite characters in literature, Jo March. She had a comical nose and she had long limbs that she didn't know what to do with and she had long hair and she was very opinionated and she had a strong mind of her own and she didn't stick to stereotypes and she loved to write. So by the time, nobody had this conversation with me, but by the time I finished reading that book, it didn't make a difference to me. You know, I was okay with it because this, I had discovered myself in the book. And when I was 16, 
um, and we were graduating from school, uh, there was this fun activity where this group was supposed to give name tags to everyone and uh, funny name tags to everyone. And obviously those who fit in better with the group got kinder name tags. Mine was Pinocchio. And I had to walk through the length of that room at 16 and go collect my name tag with the whole room in splits. And it didn't matter. And now when I look back, I think that for a 16 year old, it could have been a traumatic experience. But for me, it didn't matter because I was okay with it. And I learned to be okay with it because I had found myself in the book. So the reason why I feel that publishers and writers should think about finer nuances, the finer characteristics in children that have not been written about, because for every child to find himself in a book, what that does to their confidence and what that does to their personality is huge. So let's have diverse characters, not unidimensional characters, but characters that are a mix of lots of characteristics so that every child has a chance to discover himself or herself in a book. I think the cool thing about books is that you get to imagine a world that's different or beyond your own. Uh, schools increasingly, I think, are becoming more like clubs where people who belong to the same caste and class background go, which restricts even further the possibility of kids to know someone other than themselves. Because so many parents I know are now sending kids to a particular place because they want to hang out with the parents of those children. And, uh, you know, then diversity becomes just a buzzword. The only place we encounter diversity is in your library. And that shouldn't be the case. But that, that can be a step. That's it. I think we should also have more about body shaming in children's books because uh, with the internet, I think more and more children are now... Um, getting exposed to images and discourse that's really um, frustrating, I think. Uh, talking to Muskan talks about this um, uh, episode where Muskan is being tortured by her girlfriends to get her legs waxed and she doesn't want to do that at all. They manage to steal wax from a beauty parlor and then they, you know, they get her to lie down and they're forcing her to get waxed and she talks in great detail about the frustration. I think it's also very... Um, Helpful for boys to read that because boys grew up not knowing all of these experiences. I mean, I read Menstrupedia a few years ago and I thought this was so wonderful. I wish we had read that book, you know, in the, like, my school was a boys school up to grade four. And after that, there were girls. So I think it would have, it, we would have grown up as more sensitive boys had we read some of these uh, books at that time. Um, to end with, I think um, sometimes, um, we don't notice very carefully the paradox about diversity and inclusion. Uh, we go with this unity in diversity, you know, theme, and uh, that can that inclusion can enforce homogeneity in, instead of you know really celebrating or not even celebrating. I mean, hearing everyone's experiences because we want to include. It's almost like you know, there's this little room and we want to bring everyone in instead of saying that the room is small and we need to like make a bigger one. That would yeah. be um, diversity, I think. Right, wonderful. So I want to, I think we're out of time now, but I just want to say that I think this is a, I, I was excited to moderate this panel because I feel so strongly that we, that all our children need to see themselves in literature, their own experiences, whatever that might be and wherever they're from, and that also they need to empathize with and with the you know, students or children who might have very different experiences from them so that they develop empathy and that books can be a way to bring them into contact with, with children that they may not be seeing in their school because of the way um, schools are set up and society is set up in so many ways. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all to the audience as well. Um, and I hope that we will, I hope these discussions will encourage a more diverse publishing as we go forward. So thank you so much. Yes. And are there any questions from the audience? Sorry. Any questions for our panelists from the audience? Yes. Or comments, ideas, things you'd like to see more of in literature, anything at all? Uh, there is one topic that I think we don't have in Indian literature for our children, and that is the topic of adoption and the talk of stories that revolve around adoption for young readers and for young adults. Ela, Ela, which is on our shortlist and was given an honorable mention. Um, it's by the author Sampurna Chatterjee, and it is a beautiful book 
about a child who's been adopted, who finds out that she's been adopted. Um, and I, I have to say, I, it was for me very, very moving. It's a beautiful book. So I think, I think you're right that adoption is another area that we could have many more stories in, but I would recommend Ila just to start with. Yes, and different kinds of families, for sure. And I think also, right, we can probably find one book, like we talked about talking about Muskan or Ila about adoption, but we don't have that range of books. And I think what happens is when you have a single story to represent a, you know, a whole community in some way, because that's the only book we have for kids, that's limiting as well, right? That's a lot of pressure on that one author and that one book. Um, so we need a range. So definitely, I think different kinds of family structures um, uh, is, is important. Anybody else? Yes, at the back. Arundhati has a question. Yeah, we have two, two questions over there. Uh, actually, many. Which is great. So it's actually not a question on adoption. There are quite a few books. I think there's also a problem of not being able to get books to readers and the lack of awareness. Yes. So there's Elephants Never Forget by Tara Books. It's about a group of elephants, uh, a herd of elephants and a buffalo, and it's actually addressing the theme of adoption. That's a book for young children. There's another by Karadi. It's written in verse. I forget the title. Then there's Hot Chocolate is Thicker Than Blood, which is for young adults, published by Duck Pill. Uh, Rupa Gulab is the author. Um, then there's Ela by Sampurna Chatterjee. So there are quite a few books. I had one more in mind, I've forgotten right now. Yeah, Yamini has something to say. Yeah, Deepa Balsavar has written. So there are, there are many uh, books that are there. I think we need to find a way to connect books and readers. And I think this is one of those platforms. Uh, yeah, hi. So I don't know if mine's a question or a comment, really. <laughs> But as a parent, there's a lot of confusion now, I think, in our minds about uh, the whole age-appropriate thing. Should we just delete that from our word list entirely? Uh, do we keep that? If so, um, do we wait for them to start the conversation and then start the conversation, I mean, talk back, as in talk with them? Or do we start to initiate the dialogue on all these very diverse things? And it's great that books are available on all these very topics. But they're also exposed to all kinds of other media, which probably appropriately or inappropriately address the same things. Uh, and, you know, at different ages, they're obviously exposed to different things. And how do they take that narrative back home? So it's great that there is a social sanction right now to be able to discuss this stuff. But as parents, I think we're sitting on the fence, not really sure where we go from here. Yes, it's an open home. Yes, we're happy to discuss it. But should you be starting that dialogue or should I be initiating it with you? Uh, I don't know if you can sp spread some light on it. I, I'm going to ask the panelists first before I jump in with anything. Do you think, Chintan, would you like to speak about should parents start that conversation? I think when we think of age appropriate, we typically think only of chronological age. I think we should stop doing that and think of emotional maturity when we think of age appropriateness. Not all six-year-olds or not all 15-year-olds feel ready to embrace the same stuff. Having worked in a school, I would say a lot of my students were far more mature than the teachers in my staff room, and they would be able to handle much more complexity. So I wouldn't talk down to children and talk in the language of how do we bring this down to the level of children. I think we must, you know, like speak to them in a way that um, resonates with them. I mean, if you cannot explain a complex issue in a language that's simple, how well do you really know that issue even, is what I would say. Does anyone else want to add? Because it is true that diversity issues in a classroom, uh, in the home, parents, I think, can, can struggle with it. Anybody else want to add how you would help parents? I that think part? it has to be very organic. Like, you can't think, okay, today we are going to discuss this issue at home. It can't be. If your child is, you, one, you have to be involved in your child's life. You have to know the shows that your child is watching, the friends your child has, the conversations your child is having, and uh, the books that your child is reading. There's a reason why your child bonds with this book. So if you're involved in your child's life, and you have conversations about their friends, the things that they're doing and reading and watching, the conversation organically flows from there. So you don't have to wait for you to start a conversation or for your child to start a conversation. It's a very organic process that happens as long as you're having conversations. Yes. And I just want to add, as a teacher who taught English for a long time, 
giving kids books, just give it to them and then see if they, if they bring it up and say, so my son, for example, read uh, talking about Muskan and then he wanted to talk about it. He said, mom, this was really interesting. I've never read a book like this with a character like this. Um, and it, you know, we had a conversation about it. So I think sometimes just the book itself is, is uh, wonderful. Uh, I know we had one more question at the back. Uh, anybody else wanted to ask? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Andalib, you wanted I, to go ahead. I, sorry. I just wanted to uh, say the yes. same thing, what you were saying, that the book is a good starting point. You know, you yes. present, I think, if uh, the availability of the book and, you know, kids reading it, it's a good starting point for the conversation. So, Definitely. I was just going to say the same thing. When we are talking about inclusive society, what about the children with the special needs, children with disability? Yes. Are there enough books to know about children among themselves who have got some kind of impairment or some kind of disability that I would like so to So again, know. there are not enough books, but there are books being written and being published. Uh, Simply Nanju is an amazing yes. book. You know, Neil which... On uh, Neil on Wheels. And recently, Doug Bill has come out with this whole... Uh, you know, even that other one, uh, the boy with the crutches, um, I forget the name of the book. Sorry? Kitu's uh, Mad Day. So all these are, you know, books which are being written and published. And uh, like Arundhati was saying, it's really important that uh, parents need to be aware of the yes. availability of these books. You know, because yes. publishers are doing their bit. Writers are doing their bit. So it should be the children's own interest, you know, once they read, they come about, know to, about these children. Yes. yes. And just to add to that, Catch That Cat, which is on our shortlist of, uh, for the Neve the Awards, is also about, it also highlights a disabled protagonist, which is, which is interesting. Um, I just want to add to what Ritu said about uh, it being an organic conversation. Now, um, if we are communicating with our children and uh, if, they, if they are asking us questions, um, should we be aware that children will take the information you t tell them and uh, will process it and come back to you at very... Um, strange times about, you know, questions that uh, will startle you. I think as parents, we need to get our, over our own squeamishness and be able to answer them according to what we think they can process at that time. And uh, that's, I think, how it should go ahead. The next session commences some questions and of course, the chance and the privilege to get a chocolate that will sneaker. Okay. It tells the story of a boy called Amir from the city of Kabul. Which novel am I talking about? And it later became a movie. It tells the story of a boy called Amir in the city of Kabul. The next question is Love on a Train is by which famous Indian philanthropist? Love on a Train. Love on a Train. It tells the story of a girl who grows up Later goes to England and then returns that favor. Nobody going for it. It is by Sudha Murthy. Okay. Yeah. The namesake 2003 was made into a popular film named the author Jumpa Lahari. Yes. Which novel by Thomas Kenley won the Man Booker Award in 1982 and was made into a feature film directed by Steven Spielberg in 1993. Very simple. Schindler's List, yes. Thank you. The topic of our next panel discussion is mythology, a significant childhood memory. Mythology is an important part of any culture. Stories of Indian mythology have been passed down from one generation to another to inculcate the value of courage, adventure, compassion and love. I am sure each one of us will have the childhood memories of sitting in grandmother's lap and listening to the most amazing stories of Ram and Ravana Krishna and Kans and many more giving the message of good triumphs over evil. The next panel discussion is all about the role of mythology in creating significant childhood memories. Let's welcome a panelist. Over to you, Mr. Jayal. Good afternoon, everybody. Once again, welcome back to Neve Litfest. Radhika Menon started Tulika as an independent multilingual children's publishing house in 1996. Tulika's picture books are published in nine languages, English, Hindi, Tamil, Malayalam, Telugu, Kannada, Marathi, Gujarati, and Bengali. 
The list includes the entire range for children from 1 to 16, from picture books to fiction and non-fiction for young people. The imaginatively created books have pioneered a new wave of children's publishing in India. This year, Tulika was nominated for the best Asian children's publishers at the Bolgona Book Fair. Radhika believes that translating across different languages gives voice and image to cultural diversity in a way that publishing in one language does not. A hands-on publisher, she's deeply involved in visualizing, editing, designing and marketing of Tulika books. Ladies and gentlemen, Radhika Menon for you. दोस्तों हमारी अगली पैनलिस्ट हैं समिता अर्नी इनका व्यक्तित्व अद्भुत है इन्होंने मात्र 8 वर्ष की उम्र में लिखना शुरू कर दिया था और 12 वर्ष की उम्र में इनकी पहली पुस्तक द महाभारत अ चाइल्ड्स व्यू सात भाषाओं में प्रकाशित हुई और एल्जा मोरेंटे लिटरेरी अवार्ड जीता उस समय जहां कहीं भी ये जाती थी लोग एक ही प्रश्न पूछते थे क्या ये किताब आपकी मां ने लिखी है क्योंकि इतनी कम उम्र में ऐसा अद्भुत लेखन लोगों की कल्पना से परे था हाल ही में इनकी मिसिंग क्वीन नामक पुस्तक प्रकाशित हुई जिसमें रामायण के पात्रों को वर्तमान युग में लाकर जिस प्रकार उनका वर्णन किया गया है उसकी कोई मिसाल नहीं दोस्तों समिता के स्वागत में दो पंक्तियां प्रस्तुत हैं रंगत नई आई यहां संगत मिली जो आपकी रंगत नई आई यहां संगत मिली जो आपकी चारों ओर फैला नूर सा यूं शख्सियत है आपकी यू शख्सियत है आपकी जोरदार तालियों के साथ स्वागत कीजिए समिता का Jash Sen is an author, interviewer, and columnist. Her trilogy started with The Word Keepers, continued with Sky Ser Serpents, and will see its conclusion in Soul Army. Jash Sen has been a panelist and moderator at literature festivals like Bukharo, Kolkata, Poon, and Tata Steel Kolkata Literary Meet. She's trilingual and enjoys reading and writing in English, Bengali, and Hindi. Apart from writing, she has stints in the IT industry and teaching and is currently working in the digital publishing space. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Jash Sen. I want to invite you to this manch, Deepa Agrawal Ji, who has given the Baal Sahit Jagat in the world. Deepa Ji, with the stories, she also writes the stories. She believes that the stories are a part of the story 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 of the story. इनकी कहानियां कभी मजेदार होती हैं तो कभी संजीदा कभी डरावनी तो कभी रहस्यमयी कभी उनके अपने अनुभवों पर आधारित तो कभी प्राचीन लोक कथाओं का पुनर्कथन इन्हें कई प्रतिष्ठित साहित्य पुरस्कारों से नवाजा गया वर्ष 2008 में इनकी किताब कैरावैन टू तिबेट को इंटरनेशनल बोर्ड ऑन बुक्स फॉर यंग पीपल की ऑनर लिस्ट में स्थान दिया गया करतल ध्वनि के साथ स्वागत कीजिए दीपा अग्रवाल जी का गुड इवनिंग इज इट ऑन um the topic um uh, mythologies and folk stories um uh, it's quite obvious why we have a topic like that because mythology and folk stories is almost synonymous with um, <coughs> children's literature um and the reason i suppose it is that they are the first stories told to children uh, first stories we hear Mm, we've heard mm, when we grew up and uh, the oral nature of those stories um, they were oral to begin with and um, and uh, the nature of it uh, being such that you can innovate you can change you can add you can delete to suit the age group of the listener to the um, uh, and, and so it just lends itself. And, and when you say, when we say folk stories, we're not necessarily just talking about stories, but word plays, songs, riddles, all of them belong to this huge um, genre of folklore in every region, in every language. <clears throat> so it's very vast. And um, I think we'll begin by asking each of our panelists what are the first stories they remember hearing and um, what impact they had. Um, thank you. And first, before I answer that, what a lovely honor to be on stage with all of you. Um, I really admire all of your work, so this is a great privilege for me. Uh, to answer the question that you asked, the first book I've written is, is the retelling of the Mahabharata, and that was a story that I think, like all many of us here, we can't remember when we heard it. We sort of grew up hearing it from the womb, almost. 
And, um, but I think the story really for me struck home when I was about eight years, uh, eight years old, which is uh, approximately when I started writing it, when I, because I had moved back from Pakistan, uh, where my father had been posted with the Indian Embassy for three years, uh, the Indian Consulate in Karachi. And I came back to Delhi in uh, 92, around the time of Babri Masjid. And I was a kid in school, and of course the first question when you're a new kid in school is you're asked, where have you come from? And I had this weird American accent because I had just come from the Karachi American School, and the first thing that popped out of my head, because you know, where have you just come from, was Karachi, Pakistan. And because of my answer to that question, everyone automatically thought I was Pakistani. And this is 92, around the time of Babri Masjid, Hindu-Muslim tensions running high, a lot of uh, anti-Pakistan rhetoric on TV, and you know, children, we sort of, we, 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 we are, I mean, we, we inherit these things. We, we find ourselves replicating all of these things that we hear on TV or in newspapers or in our parents' conversations. So, since I'd come from Karachi, Pakistan, everyone thought I was Pakistani, no one wanted to be my friend. I got nicknamed PP, which meant Pagal Pakistani. And for a couple of years, I was a very uh, lonely, friendless child, and I would go home and cry every day. And my parents were like, oh, well, you should have told them you're Indian. Of course, that I knew, that I assumed, because that's the passport I had. I'd, when people asked me the question of where I'd come from, Karachi was the, the answer. And um, I, had, I spent all of my time uh, escaping into books and escaping to stories. And I think stories often offer us healing. They offer us catharsis. They subconsciously reflect many of the issues that we ourselves are experiencing in our lives. And the story that attracted me most was the story that I'd heard so often, which was the Mahabharata. And it was a, it's a story about two, fam two you know, sets of cousins at war with each other, which to me was so much like the situation between Indian, India and Pakistan. I mean, cousins or brothers or the same family at war with each other, unable to understand, you know, and I felt very much in the middle of that conflict, in the middle of that war, because I was an Indian, I had lived in Pakistan, I had f wonderful friends who had left behind Mac in Karachi, who I missed very much, and here I was, Indian, coming back to India, um, and I had no friends in my own country. And so the story of the Mahabharata really appealed to me then, because it's a story that explores many of these sorts of emotions of disinheritance, of uh, families being pulled apart, of misunderstanding, all of those, and that's what the story became for me. Um, and I think through writing that, I was able to express a lot of what I was feeling. And um, this is also why I think myths are so important because they offer us a way to understand, to navigate our own life experiences. And that's why they remain classics, they remain timeless because they're always true to our experience in any given time. Uh, so that's it. Well, I can't top that. But my, my, my first memory of, um, uh, uh, you know, stories, it's not the Ramayana or the Mahabharat. For me, it was a collection of folk tales that uh, I think every Bengali child has probably read or heard. Um, and it's called Takumar Juli, so, which literally translated as grandmother's bag full of stories. And what they were, were folk tales collected by this one man called Dukhina Ranjan Mitro Mojumdar, who went and, you know, just met a vast number of people in different parts of Bengal to collect these folk tales, which he then got out in, in, in the form of three volumes. Thanks to him, our folk tales are in a large part alive and well. And what I used to, I think, love um, about them, and I still do, um, is the fact that, you know, you um, encounter someone who's probably going through a lot worse than you are as a child at some point in time. Um, it, your protagonist need not even be human. Your protagonist can be a little monkey or, um, or, or an owl. But the pain you feel, what you go through, the powerlessness you might feel, and children are so powerless. We forget how powerless uh, you are when you grow up, but it's, you feel terribly powerless as a child. And then to, you know, sort of circumvent all that and, you know, go through this major journey where you're, at the end, a winner. That, I think, was my kick. I used to go back to that book and those stories again and again and again. I confess I still do. And now I find many flaws. There are gender issues. There are many issues that, you know, I can challenge. But at that point in time, as a child, um, where I identified with a little monkey, um, you know, he was my hero. He gave me strength. 
Yes. <laughs> so that, that was my first, sorry. Well, uh, I come from a rather remote part of the country, in, way up in the hills of Kumau. So my experiences would be rather different. And uh, like Josh, the first stories that I remember hearing were folk tales. And uh, well, since we lived in a very semi-rural area where lots of trees and birds and wildflowers, you know, to this day, I just adore wildflowers. And some of the folk tales that I heard were connected with the birds that we heard chirping and, you know, the wildflowers growing around us. So I've, it, it sort of helped me to connect with everything around me in such a way that there was a story about the bird that was chirping at a particular time of the year or a wildflower that some sprang up only in the evening. So uh, I just love those stories. And uh, uh, in the last session, Janvi Barua was talking about, you know, being connected to your roots. So some of these stories have stayed with me because uh, when you move out of the area that you grew up in, and at that time in my childhood, we were pretty cut off, I must say, because, you know, uh, the traveling down to the plains, as we called, called it, was a long journey. It was not so easy. So we were in a kind of, uh, what should I say, uh, in a, uh, an environment that was sort of set apart from maybe the mainstream of the country. And uh, we experienced it also. <laughs> uh, so that's why these were my childhood memories of stories. And uh, when I later on began to write for children, though I didn't begin by writing folk tales, I wrote my own stories. But uh, when the opportunity came, I went back to those stories because I had loved them so much that I wanted to share them with children. Usually that's the um, track. You hear stories as children and then you, as writers in your adult's life, they uh, kind of come back to you. But Samita has this extraordinary story where she, um, you know, started writing at this very early age and linked to the kind of experience she had. Not all children do that, but that was mm, quite extraordinary. And the book remains uh, uh, um, uh, a very, um, well, uh, uh, a landmark book. And, um, well, from oral uh, stories, it, uh, you know, slowly they were written, they were printed, mm, and... Uh, mm, they took on a more structured narrative. And um, with printed books, uh, they, you know, books got printed, reprinted, and um, traveled. Um, it it uh, reached many more people. It is a voice of a single author, but it reached widely. Uh, unlike oral narratives, which were restricted to communities, and it changed from teller to teller. So here you had mm, one, um, voice reaching out to many, mm, uh, a very wide audience with one kind of narrative. So slowly, a select canon of stories got um, uh, projected, got picked up, and um, they became the dominant narratives. And, um, and quite naturally, the dominant narratives were of the majority uh, communities. And we just have to think Amachitra Katha, and we, I mean, it kind of falls in place. It's one kind of dominant narrative that, you know, entire gener generations have gone up, grown up um, with. And uh, their understanding of history and mythology comes from that. They were uh, in this very enticing comic format, very reasonably prized and very popular even today. And, um, uh, they have been retold, re-edited, and so on. But um, those, those stayed. They had remarkable um, impact on just about everything, including um, uh, films and animation, the style, the visual style um, kind of was very faithful to Am Amachitra Katha. And what is interesting is that Amachitra Katha illustrators in the early days used 
um, Marlon Brando and uh, Greta Garbo and so on as the models for drawing the gods and goddesses. So, uh, you know, um, and that has uh, stayed with us and leaves such a strong impact. The visual impact is so strong. I have heard a student of journalism argue that no gods and gods don't have beards and uh, because Amachita Katha gods don't have beards meaning that's how legitimate it became, how permanent the printed word um, can become and the power of the dominant narrative. Think Disney. I mean, Disneyization of fairy tales, um, it's a remarkable phenomenon at one, st one time, um, meaning they were the narratives of the time that the um, European fairy tales, nobody remembered. The saws, nobody, most, I, I'm sure there's, there are generations all over the world because the reach was so wide that they uh, imagined uh, stories. I mean, they, I don't think though they know names of Charles Perrault or, or Grimm's brothers or Hans Christian Andersen. It's Walt Disney. So the the power of a, of a, a dominant narrative. What do you think? Have we got out of the stranglehold <laughs> of these dominant narratives today? Do we have more? plural um, uh, narratives in our books for children? Would any of you? Yeah, you go, you go, you go first. Yeah. Oh, um, okay, I, th I think we're slowly moving away from that. I've seen, um, you know, the second book that I've worked on is Sita's Ramayana, and I think with, you know, and I've seen not just that book, but there are multiple retellings of Sita and now also of different female characters from myths that are t at using the uh, textual uh, dominant narrative form to really contest this. But I do think we need more of this. And I think sometimes I also feel that we emphasize too much on text versus visual narratives because visual narratives often uh, accompany oral narratives as well. And they reflect a very different politics. They come from a very different socioeconomic uh, place in society. Um, you know, the Sita's Ramayana comes out of a Patua tradition. It's illustrated by Moina Chitraka, who's a Patua artist, and you know, Patuas uh, are Dalits. They're outside of the, you know, the, the, they're at the bottom of the caste system. And I think, and these sorts of narratives often challenge our concepts of gender, of hegemony, of, of so many things. And I think um, the reliance on, on text sometimes, or the primacy of text, reflects a very Brahmanical mindset. And I feel we need to break away from that and actually not just explore our, our texts or we just n not just explore the epics and the Upanishads and all of that, but go to those visual forms, go to the scrolls, go to the temples, go to all kinds of different kinds of uh, visual forms to see if they ch how they challenge these dominant power narratives as well. Yeah, uh, you know, I love that point. The one thing, however, I th uh, that I thought, Amar Chatrak got, got right, and what we can kind of, um, we can learn from is that they simultaneously published in multiple languages. So any narrative, you know, if it has to eventually get itself out there, has to mimic that. I mean, I think the time has come in this day and age, especially, where in a country as plural as ours, where if a book comes out in English, it should simultaneously come out in you know, all the other Indian languages, hopefully. Because what we are seeing now is, is actually a little, um, it's, it's a new kind of Brahminical uh, elitism, isn't it? Uh, where uh, we are seeing a lot of interesting content coming out only in English. We don't know what is coming out in Bangla. Had I not, had, had someone not pointed out and you know, given me this book, I would not have known that there's this phenomenal thriller that's going to become a trilogy in Bangla called Bindu Bishargo, based on a conspiracy theory, um, well, based on one person's research that the Ramayana may have been a Dalit creation. And then there's a whole, you know, thriller and conspiracy behind it, et cetera, et cetera. It's a phenomenal book, but it's in Bangla. So, you know, until it's there in every other language, most of us will not be able to enjoy it. So the reason I mention trilingual everywhere, you know, <laughs> loudly is because I, I'm very lucky. I consider myself so fortunate. I have, you know, access to three times uh, the number of books and therefore that many narratives. But I wish I knew 25, which is not possible. It's not possible for all of us to know 25 languages. But therefore, I think books now have to, you know, we have to try and challenge the oral narrative by being there in multiple languages. Uh, and I don't think we're doing that. No, but I think multiple languages um, 
is not the answer in itself in the sense it, it, it is, I mean, Amachita Kata being translated into different languages doesn't change It's It still is the no dominant it is narrative. from that language, like you talk about the, you know, from the language, from the community. Language has its own dominant, uh, the regions have their own dominant narratives, but many more voices and many more languages, yes, completely. Yeah, I, you know, uh, I personally feel when we are retelling myths, we should uh, look beyond whatever, you know, the written text, as you rightly said, and also think of, you know, the theatrical performances. You know, my, my early memories, as I said, I grew up in a semi-rural area, are the Ram Leela performances. And, uh, you know, the concept of, of the Ramayan that you get from a theatrical performance, and particularly it's, by, you know, from... Uh, amateurs, people who, you know, do it once a year and they do it with great fervor. And uh, there's not that serious kind of, I mean, there is reverence, definitely. But uh, because they are not, uh, you know, uh, tuned to the Sanskrit text or whatever from wherever it is derived, or they even removed from the Tulsi Das Ramayan, you could say, they are somewhere infusing themselves, their culture, into their enactments. So this is what I find very fascinating, you know, the performances of the Ram Leela and also, you know, the folk songs. So these are the narratives I feel we should also pay attention to when we are retelling our myths. So you get so many interesting nuances, you know, which... Uh, you may not encounter otherwise. There's one more thing I've always felt. I mean, uh, you know, inevitably, when you first encounter uh, your mythology of your time, you're a child. And it's very often edited um, to make it suitable for children. And of course, the actual richness of the epic or the mythology, which, which will in, you know, in, involve erotic symbolism, philosophy, different depth of thinking, not just, you know, and different, therefore, interpretations as you get older. It's so important to read our myths as adults, to reread them in their entirety. Because you know a simple story as a child, and you love it from whichever perspective. And but that's one very simple layer of the story. There are so many layers and depths to our myths uh, and to our folk tales, which are so allegorical. It's very important to go back and, and read them uh, as an adult and to find new meaning. So I get very annoyed when people assume that a folk tale is for children, um, because it's anything but. And ca can I add one more thing? I mean, as Josh was speaking, I was, you know, and you go back and look at these um, stories as, 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 as adults. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Our fan panel went by really fast. No, but also who's trans... A lot of us are receiving these texts and these myths in translation. And who is the translator? Often adds a huge kind of dimension to it. I think a case in point uh, is the... I mean, this is to refer to Western stuff, but the Odyssey has been recently translated for the first time by a woman. And it's a remarkably different translation than ha uh, has been done by men. It's, uh, it's because it brings out all kinds of aspects of the Odyssey that are quite gendered and quite misanthropic that uh, only a woman could have been aware of in the nuances of language and so on and so forth. So I think also who the translator is and we have always got to realize that we're coming with a certain perspective that is already imposed on the text. Yeah, I think what, uh, I mean, I just have to um, cut short or let's, uh, uh, what we were going to discuss since it was only five minutes. What it really means is that myths and folk stories offer mm, ways of, um, um, I mean, a writer can um, contextualize them in a way for the current times. At any time, you find that. And you find that in performances. I mean, it's not just uh, in, in art, in performances, in, uh, in writing. And, um, says, you know, they are replete with, uh, with uh, biases, caste, class, gender, um, sexual um, biases, homosexuality biases. So, um, and, and there is a way that um, is also offered uh, by the same stories um, that, you know, you can subvert these things and, and uh, create equally powerful stories. And that's what... Uh, writers do, and um, now with with uh, 
uh, uh, with with um, uh, the printed books uh, going beyond the book. Um, it has, of course, as we th saw, screen, uh, film, and television, and so on. Now into the digital medium, and um, uh, so what we need to keep in mind is: is there genuinely uh, a diverse voices, diverse tellings that are coming out of this, or is it kind of the walls closing in on um, on? on single or a similar kind of narratives. I think what we need to be alert to um, as writers, as creators of um, uh, children's books, of in, being involved in children's books is the um, uh, danger of a single story in the words of the wonderful writer Chimamande Adiche, which is really what it can become. We can talk about the plurality of our uh, culture, the, um, the, the, the diversity, but uh, really if that is not, if our understanding is not that, when we create these stories in whatever form, in whatever medium, then we are still narrating that single story and uh, where does that leave us? And this is what we don't want to do, you know. We, and I think we are trying to do it as uh, Samatha did with her Sita's Ramayana and other, you know, traditional stories apart from myths, there are all other traditional narratives like, for example, uh, there is a story from my region which is actually also a performed story about, uh, you know, it's a romance called Rajula Malushahi. So I have retold it for children and what was very interesting about this uh, 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 story from the Bardic tradition of my region was that the woman, the girl, she takes the initiative in the romance. And there is a lot of fantasy. There's a huge fantasy element in it. And uh, so, you know, I felt this is a wonderful story, but it has never been, you know, come out in print, at least in English. I mean, there were versions of it in Hindi. So I felt this, you know, that way we can take little na known stories out into the wider world. And, uh, you know, let people discover them, that these are, maybe regional traditions which people are not aware of at all. So this is another thing we can do with our folklore. Um, audience, we don't have much time, but if there is any question. Yeah, madam, I have seen uh, your video on creativity uh, in which uh, there is a video, uh, your TED talk is on creativity, yes. where, there, where you are saying that uh, there, there should be a ratio of time that you spend in uh, consuming versus creating. So m my question was, uh, do you call, is reading a creative activity? Can we consider it as? Reading is consumption. It's mindful consumption. Okay. But unless you're reading to inform yourself widely and feeding it back, into creating your own story or your own work of writing, reading by itself is not an act of creation. You are appreciating someone else's wonderful creative endeavor or endeavors when you read. And it's of course extremely important to read widely and, and reading is very, very important, don't get me wrong. But reading by itself is not a creative act. Yeah, um, it is an act of consumption. Imagination is involved though. Though imagination yes, is involved. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. But you have to feed that imagination eventually by creating something with that imagination. So it's fine if you say I read very widely and at the end of it, uh, what comes out is a dance performance that's, or, or, or a work of art. I've painted something. That's fine. I'm not saying it has to go from text to text or story to story. But reading should inform and inspire, hopefully, to get back to creating something of your own. That was the context I was coming from because the lens of my talk, of course, was for people who wanted to get more creative in their day-to-day -day life. And I felt there that reading is essential, but reading by itself is not an act of creativity.
Hi. Uh, we all know mythology is very important for the kids. And um, if I had the struggle when my daughter was very young that um, our mythology sometimes gets very dark. There's brothers fighting brothers and killing happening everywhere. You know, if you look at child stories like Prahlad or Abhimanyu, I'm not sure if a five-year-old should be hearing those stories because Abhimanyu gets killed by a like own family or Prahlad, the same story. Uh, what kind of editing you expect from parents when you tell mythology or explain those stories? And at what age do we need to expose them? You know, we live in a cruel world. And I'm not saying uh, that means that every single child should be traumatized right from birth. But, um, but I do believe that our epics, our mythology, indeed any epic, any mythology, if you're talking about Iliad and, and the Odyssey as well, they are replete with dark themes. Many of our fairy tales are so very dark. Red Riding Hood is a very dark story. It's a fairy tale. It's actually, that's one of the reasons these stories exist, to gently introduce darker concepts to children. And that's my take on it. I think there is some censoring parents need to do. Most children's versions of epics and books do a certain amount of censoring. But as stories, um, I think um, these stories are essential. And I think they're essential also because of the fact that there is darkness. Because it helps us deal with it as we grow up. I mean, I read my folk tales, I think, when I was a very, very powerless and bullied child. And it helped. And I read fairly dark stories because folk tales are nearly almost always dark. They have dark beginnings, at the very least. That, that's my view. Uh, I think also we sort of, in, in this country at least, we often expect our mythology to, be, we, we conflate mythology with tradition, we expect it to be very ideal. And the, to be honest, my take on this is that these are, they, there are great, there's great value in these stories. These are it, revealing aspects of the human psyche of what it means to be human. We all go through anger, we all go through revenge, we all feel the need for justice in our lives. And this is what our stories are. But they're not telling us how to be ideal humans. And I think we have to make that distinction. They're explaining what the world is like around us. They're not telling us, this is how you behave. And I think a lot of people, uh, I've seen a lot of parents who read myths expecting children, this is the way to behave. We're expecting these stories to be like, this is, you should be like this character. That's not it for me. This is about, this is how the world is. It's not about how you should be. I think yeah, it's also like finally the choice of the stories. You know, there are stories that make you uncomfortable. So as long as you're comfortable in the telling or the writing, um, the story is not going to come out right. And uh, so I think that's what is important. There are really no rules, but there are so many aspects of these stories that appeals to us as individuals, the kind of people we are. And, um, you know, that, so you have to find your comfort zone when you are um, uh, dealing with children and, uh, you know, which gives them their comfort zone. And I'm, of course, uh, looking at books and um, you know, how they work, you know, how I they think, can uh, work. I think a parent has to have understanding of what their child will respond to and be comfortable with. Because we, we, we know that all children are not the same, their reactions will not be the same. They are very sensitive children who cry when you tell them fairy stories. And there are other children who will not turn a hair. And uh, I have a six-year-old grandson who says Ravan is his favorite character. <laughs> I remember he went up and he said, I like Ravan the best. He killed everybody. So you see, every child is so different. There are children who cannot bear to watch you know, animated movies because they are so vivid and uh, they get nightmares and things. So I think it's just you have to understand, you know, what your child will respond to or be, you know, terrified by and, you know, just ease them into the stories at, a, you know, at the appropriate time or if you think it's not suitable, then just let it be. Let them discover. They'll always, uh, sooner or later, they'll discover these stories on their own. I think We'll uh, wind that up and thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you so much.
but his poetry found way through oral traditions, person to person, word to word, and generation to generation. These were the words of Dastan Go, Ankit Chadda. He is no longer with us, and we stand here honoring a great storyteller. Last year, on this very stage, where we, we heard him talk about trends and traditions in storytelling, where he passionately spoke about how storytelling has evolved. Ankit also interacted with children through his book, Amir Khusro, The Man in Riddles, how words were riddles, how mystery concealed in words where each clue must be unraveled. He introduced children to Indian poetry via riddles, and he believed that children should create riddles around everything that they see. The youngest Dastan go, gone too soon, and a Dastan of loss to literature. His best friend said, always in memory, in Zuban, in Dastan, Ankit Chadda. एक पीर साहब के खानका के बाहर पहुंची और उससे बोली कि ये शेख साहब जो अंदर बैठे हैं ये महबूब इलाही हैं अल्लाह के महबूब हैं ये बहुत पहुंचे हुए हैं और आज रीन वो लड़का जो भी भी बच्चा था ये जानता था और मार्केट में घूम रहे बहुत फ्रॉड बाबाओं को देख चुका था बोला कि अंदर जो बैठे हैं अगर वो इतने ही पहुंचे हुए हैं ना तो मैं यहां दिल में अपने एक शेर कहूंगा उन तक पहुंच जाना चाहिए तो ये लड़का शेर कहता है कि तेरे दर पे आप कबूतर बन जाता बाज है तेरे दर पे आप कबूतर बन जाता बाज है ऐशाह तूने दी क्या मुझको आवाज है यह कह रहा था कि पीर साहब के खानका के अंदर से खादिम दौड़ा दौड़ा आया और आकर इस लड़के से पूछता है कि आप तुर्क हैं लड़का बोला जी हां क्यों क्या हुआ बोला वो पीर साहब ने आपके दिल की बात सुन ली है जवाब भेजा है बोले क्या जवाब भेजा है बोले कहते हैं जो जानता है सच वो मेरा हमराज है नादा है वो इस दर से जिसे एतराज है ये सुनकर वो लड़का हक्का बक्का रह जाता है दौड़ा दौड़ा जाता है खानकाह के अंदर और देखता है कि पीर साहब बीच में बैठे हैं और उनके चेहरे पर एक नूर है चारों लोगों चारों तरफ से लोगों ने उन्हें घेरा हुआ है और उनके चेहरे पर ये जो नूर है ये रंग है ऐसा रंग है जिसकी तलाश खुसरो आज तक करते आ रहे थे वहीं उनके कदमों में गिर पड़ते हैं बहुत देर तक वहां पड़े रहते हैं और फिर उठकर अपनी मां की तरफ देखते हैं और कहते हैं मां आज रंग है मां आज रंग है to move on shape shifting migration and identity in literature a topic very close to my heart for someone who was born in madhya pradesh schooled in kolkata and chennai and then went on to study my masters in pune learned german in munich and finally i hope so have settled down in bangalore i have always wondered how these places have changed my identity for a child migration can be scary leaving old friends fear of being accepted Migration stories have always played a role in children's literature. Each story takes us down many memory lanes and makes us think, who am I and do I belong? Yes, the next section is on shape shifting, migration and identity, identity in literature, for which we have our uh, moderator, panelist, Oliver Formanaman. He is uh, from Australia and uh, when he was a kid, he was a class clown. And uh, till date, he's someone who loves to make people laugh. whether it's on the page with writing humor for kids or on stage as a comedian he's passionate about working with kids and has been a primary school teacher although himself a comedian he truly believes that kids are the little masters of comedy his books are packed with laughs but also carry a lot of heart oliver has, has appeared on stage and on national television and on radio for his comic gigs a little trivia about him as a child oliver had a fascination with dinosaurs and wanted to write about them however all grown up now he dreams of reading about an oliver soris one day oliver is also proud to be a room to read uh, author ambassador a non profit organization that brings literature to kids all around the world oliver i don't think i need to introduce our next panelists but there are some little kids over here maybe for them 
Remember Doordarshan, the only channel we had? Then you obviously cannot not know our next guest, Mr. Jayant Kriplani. I think the claps say it all, but for the little ones. He is one of the first and finest small screen stars of the country. He featured in some of the most popular television series of the 1980s like Khandan and later G, G Mantri Ji, 2003, which was an Indian adaptation of BBC's satirical sitcom, Yes, Minister. Like you watch your series, I used to wait to watch that on TV. And those were so much better. <laughs> Versatile as an actor and director, Jayanth carried his charismatic aura over the years with his sheer talent. It is with the same ease that he dabbles in literature too. In his book, New Market Tales, he talks about bravery born from the ancient Indian wisdom of acceptance. Welcome, Jayanth. Thank you. Talking about migration, imagine coming from a traditional East, the traditional East in the 70s, and migrating and shifting to the modern West. Our next speaker, Dr. Nadia Hashimi, represent, presents uh, um, Hashimi's parents, migrated from, from Afghanistan to the United States in the early 70s. They intended to uh, return to Afghanistan, but since it wasn't safe to return back there, they stayed back in New York and became entrepreneurs. And today, she's, uh, even today, she talks about how the Afghan culture is so close to our heart. Please welcome on stage, Dr. Nadia Hashimi. Were you ever a misfit or did you have issues blending in? No, maybe you were the class pet or were not. Did you even miss those friends you left when your parents relocated? Or were you one of those types who reveled in finding yourself in new friends in new places? Well, our next guest has created characters who faced all these challenges. But then what really mattered was that they changed the world together. Please welcome on stage, Kate Darton. <laughs> All right, so let's um, start off with uh, a quick story about um, this idea of where do you come from? It's a question that people have always asked me when I was a kid growing up. And when someone said, oh, Pomovan, so where you're from? And I'm like, oh, I'm from um, Sydney. And I go, no, no, where are you really from from? And I'm like, um, Auburn Hospital. And I go, no, like where are you really from, from, from? And basically what they want to know is why I look like this. Um, living in Australia, surrounded by white people. And so I've always stood out, not just the hair, um, but basically as the only Asian kid at my school. So I've had lots of experience wanting to fit in. And all my stories are always about kids who feel like they don't really belong. And so I'm really fortunate to be joined by three other writers who have written experiences about this yearning of wanting to belong somewhere. So I'm going to start off with um, a question that um, is for the whole panel. So when you move to a new country, you tend to let go of things from your old previous culture or your old life. So it might start off with your um, traditions, your clothing, sometimes it could be things that you don't want to let go. In my mum's case, it was the food. My mum and dad have always been great Thai cooks, and so when they moved to Australia, they were always cooking Thai food, much to my dismay, because I love pizza instead. But, um, but that was okay. It was a, a sense for them to bring back the old country to where they live now. So, um, John, I'm going to start with you. What is the first thing you or your characters lose when they come to a new place or new country, and what is the one thing that they cling on to? I think you're talking to the wrong guy for that because uh, I I've never thought of any place as a new place. It's always been my place, you know. And even though um, I mean, I mean, Calcutta was my home, I left Calcutta, went to a new place called Bombay, but felt completely at home there. And when I was in Manhattan, I felt completely from home in Manhattan. So I've really not thought of myself as a displaced person, as it were, uh, to go to some place to study or some. Life's just been so good, and, and, and I, I haven't faced any of the problems that you faced, which is, mm. you know, where are you from, from, from. Yeah. Uh, though that, uh, so I guess I've just been lucky. What else can I say? And uh, I just, 
And if somebody is very unconsciously, there, there, there are times, and I'm, uh, I, I've uh, been, been at fault there too. Um, in the, if, if they're racist or communalist in any way, then it's, you know, from, they're coming from a space of inquiry, not prejudice. That's what I've always felt. Uh, where are you from? From from? It's more a, a, a desire to understand where I'm from, 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 as opposed to uh, being worried about my color or my features or anything. So, as I said, I've been very lucky in not being a victim of any adverse comments. Nice. Yeah. And Nadia? Yeah, I think um, you know. For for me, I, I always try to not put myself as a character into any of my books or my direct experiences, but I do steal from people around me through observation and hopefully in a way that nobody in my family or friend circle will <laughs> recognize themselves and hate me for it. But um, I think what I've seen happening to people who have been transposed from one country to another is that they sort of hit this limbo period where they're wondering where is home and where am I? And then that next generation then does wonder, well, where am I from? Because people can recognize, at least in the United States where I live, where so many people in our neighborhoods are, are originally from another country. And yes, there is that, that counterpoint of like, well, everyone in the United States, aside from Native Americans, is from, from, from another country. Mm. Um, but then there's the reality of, well, how many generations back? And I, I think there's truth to the reality that, um, you know, once you're here for several generations, something gets diluted. Hmm. I think a lot of people lose language. I know my children are not able to speak in Farsi the way that I can. Hmm. And my Farsi is not, uh, you know, eloquent by any means either. And so, you know, one thing that I think I see being lost in my own children, our own family members, is language. Um, and then I think also the, you know, the, that sense that you only marry within your own culture. That's mm -hmm. a huge shift that we see happening in the United States as well. And so there's a little bit of dilution of one culture, but an integration with another culture, mm -hmm. which I think yields another beautiful mix of, um, you know, foods and celebrations and holidays. And so you get to do... But of everything when you're living in a different household. So there are things that every household has to decide, you know, what is, and every individual has to decide is what is important to me? What do I need to hold on to? Mm. What do I um, want to make sure that I include and pass on to the next generation? And then there are things that are, you might have to make space for the new that's coming mm. in as well. Okay. Um, I would say I am a very itinerant person. So I am of American origin. Uh, I hold an American passport. I lived in New Delhi in India for five years, mm -hmm. and I now live in Europe. And so I'm constantly faced with the question, where are you from? Mm -hmm. And my answer depends on my audience. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the context. But your question was, I think, what do you, what do you? Uh, so what's the, um, so what when you, you move to a new place, what's the first thing you lose, and okay. what's the last thing you cling on to? I'll tell you, when I moved from India to um, Europe, mm. we had to pack up all of our things in boxes. And we arrived in Amsterdam with the smell of like nimbu and all yeah. of these things, you know, the, the spices that we had used to cook in India. And I pressed my face against them and I smelled them. I felt so homesick for India. Mm. So I think the first thing to go often is that those primary senses, you know, the five senses that we authors all use in our books. Mm. I think the last thing to go is friendship. You retain your friends, you retain the connections that you have to the place. And that's the most important thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, speaking about friendships, you know, with um, social media, with the internet now, the whole world is at your fingertips and the whole world comes straight to you via your, your phones. And so I guess in this modern age of, uh, oh, thank you. In, in this modern age of, you know, tech, an age where the world kind of feels smaller now, is it easier for kids these days to fit into a new place? Uh, John? 
can I take this up a notch a mm. bit, right? We have four, I'm going to make a few assumptions here. We have four extremely privileged people living here uh, mm. and, and on this stage and talking, very privileged. We have privileges that other millions of people don't even have, right? Mm. You're talking about children going to a new place. What comes to mind immediately is that from 1947, mm. when we got our independence, up to the end of the century, that is 2000, that there are 65 million people who were forced to be displaced mm. and go into different areas within the country. We have 65 million refugees within. That's what I meant by let me take this up a notch and get mm. out from this privileged space that we are yeah. in. And the children, if you ask a privileged child, uh, uh, if you are displaced, what is the first thing you're going to take with you? He's going to talk about his game box or he's going to talk about his uh, uh, TV set or his video player. But if you ask one of those guys who's been displaced by a dam or by a riot, um, or, or what, what is the first thing as a refugee? Now you're a refugee within the country. What is the first? He would say, I'm going to head for my cash and I'm going to head for the utensils that I cook in. And that for me is uh, far more concerned than what any of us would feel mm. as children in a different place. I know perhaps this is the wrong forum for thing, but I just felt I had to say. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, you know um, I was in the I was just sitting in the um, inc inclusion panel, and one of the um, panelists said, um, you know, how come there's not many books about the refugee experience? And I'm sure kids will get so much more insight if they were able to place themselves into the shoes of someone who's had to move all of a sudden to a brand new place. And so um, perhaps that's something that we can explore um, later on as well. So yeah, so could you, um, could, yeah, just continue on with Naya. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad that you, you did mm. kick it up a notch because yeah. I think that's where we challenge ourselves to face the realities. Mm. And those are the realities that our kids are already thinking about and hearing about, even if it's just tangentially through friends and, and, and the news or whatnot. Um, you know, one of my adult books is about the refugee crisis. It is about a family that is displaced from Afghanistan, forced to flee and, and cross into Europe where they're sort of in this limbo of not knowing where home is going to be. Um, and then my children's book is one in which uh, a young boy is living in the United States. He was born in the United States, but knows that his mother is originally from Afghanistan, does not realize that she's actually in the US undocumented and learns about her status when he's around 12 years old. And then one day he watches as she's led away by authorities and he believes he's alone in the country and has to find some kind of person to connect with again. So, you know, those are the kinds of stories that I think are, are really tough to think about what is a child experiencing in those situations. In the US, you probably all have heard about this horrific experience of families being separated at the border and children being removed from their parents mm. and you know, when I think about those kids and what are the things that they are longing for, it's certainly not an Xbox, it's certainly mm. not, you know, even a favorite blanket, but sometimes it may just be the comfort of having a loved one right next to them. Mm. Yes, a hug. I mean, yeah. and even some of the professionals working in the, or the, the staff working in these facilities are not allowed to touch, to physically touch these children. And that human touch, that, that feeling that someone is concerned about your welfare and not just here are you know, f the thousand calories that we need you to consume today so that you are alive tomorrow and we can report your existence is still here. You know? mm. Okay, I'm gonna take it back down a couple <laughs> notches. <laughs> <laughs> I applaud you both. Um, when I got here two days ago, I was walking up to the author's lounge and I looked down and all the kids were playing, the need kids were playing. And there were some boys and they were playing cricket with a ping pong paddle, which I thought was very <laughs> ingenious. And then I looked over and there was a, the ping pong ball had kind of rattled away. And the little boy who was waiting for his turn, because he was bored, he did the swish swish, you know, the swish swish dance, you know. I can't do it, I won't pretend. It's like. Yeah. This thing, can you do oh, it? Oh yeah, it's the, it's, the, it's the floss. Oh, the, the floss. floss, yes. Okay, so he was doing the floss. Yeah. And I was like, here I am in Bangalore, India, with this little kid doing the floss. And yesterday I was in Amsterdam, and there was a kid doing the floss. Yeah. And if I went to New York City, there'd be a kid doing the floss. 
And your question is about how small the world has become. Like mm. all these kids are watching whoever it is, Katy Perry, or you know, and learning the floss. And so, yeah, I think the world is getting smaller because the influencers are getting greater. There are fewer people who are influencing these kids, and they're all doing the same thing around the world. Does it make it easier to fit in? Yeah, it makes it easier to fit in. If that kid in Bangalore moves to Amsterdam, he can do the floss with the kids in Amsterdam. Um, it's just an illustration to say, mm -hmm. I think it's easier to fit in with such an interconnected world, but that doesn't mean that there aren't incredible regional differences to celebrate. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And I think like, you know, there's also kids in Sydney as we speak doing the floss right now. So thanks to this wonderful game called Fortnite. And so all the kids were probably up in arms going, oh yeah, Fortnite, Fortnite. And all the parents are going, oh no, not Fortnite, not Fortnite. But you know, yeah, that's the beauty of it all. You, we're, we're, we're playing games with kids all around the world, which is, which is really great. So, um, so I guess just coming back to this idea of wanting to share some of the experiences of, of refugees. And so, um, Nadia, ha, ha, in terms of like writing the book and the process you went through, like, like how do you keep those characters and voices authentic like I think to, to keep any character authentic it's um, there has to be a conscious decision every time I sit at the at the laptop that I need to walk away from myself mm. and walk into this character and be absolutely certain that every word that I'm typing is authentically coming out of that person's head and it's not my thoughts or what I would do in that character, mm. in their actions, or in their decision making, or in their fears, like they they have to be completely different than me, mm. um, and that sometimes is hard to do because you, I'm not any of my characters. A lot of my characters are far braver than I am. They're far wittier than I am. They're you know funnier than I am, uh, and and that's as it should be because they should not reflect me. But it actually takes for me a very conscious decision where I, I sometimes and periodically during the day sit back and say, okay, but what would he do? What would he do, especially if I'm writing about a young boy, um, that's it's very removed from my own experience. Hmm. And so just to pass it on to um, anyone else wants to share about how they um, capture that authenticity and that genuine voice when it comes to setting or, or characters. I said it uh, earlier uh, for all the people who were there earlier, this is going to be repetitive. What I do is, because I'm an actor hmm. um, by profession, I find it easier to become that person that I'm writing about. And uh, then it's a question of transference. This mic is not working. Maybe I'm not holding it correctly. How about that? Yeah, OK. Fine. <laughs> this is supposed to be my profession, and I'm holding it badly. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, so w what I do is I get into In the movies business, you have something called a backstory mm. of the character. You might never see the backstory on screen, mm. but you need to know the backstory as an actor. Mm. Uh, th then you can layer the, that, that character and play the, that character in a more genuine way, in a more believable way, in a way that is true, because ultimately we're all looking for the truth in that character. Mm. So I use that skill of mine to give my characters, especially in this book, because this is the first book I ever wrote, uh, I really went into each person's backstory. I created a backstory of them. Some of them were refugees uh, from Sindh and uh, who came to Calcutta and started their shops and, and uh, did their business. So one had to get to the truth of that person I'm writing about. And the only way to do that is to give them a backstory that is completely credible. Mm -hmm. and then I become them and I write them. So you, you might, you know, everybody talks about writing having a voice. You might hear three or four voices in that, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I found quite awkward actually, because I thought, you know, I had a voice, but it wasn't. You know, there were three or four voices in that book. So I really haven't, I think, matured yet as a writer. And I mean, you know, I, I only read the introduction and you, s and you actually apologize if you've you apologize to the readers who hear themselves in, in your characters sometimes because you are just merely getting observations of, of things that you've seen. So it's, it's really great. So, okay, um, so I mean, I guess when you talk about your experience in, in Delhi for those five years, how much of that did you put into writing The Misfits? Like, 
I put quite quite a bit in in terms of my inspir. I was very inspired by the place. Mm. So. I lived in an apartment, for example, facing a park in South Delhi in Vasan Vihar. My children played in that park and there was a beautiful champa tree in the park. And there was, a, there was a street dog that lived outside the park who became very important to our family. So those, those scenes and those places wove their way into the story. You were talking about voice. It's written in the voice of a 12, 11-year-old girl that person doesn't exist. So the entire story is told through her eyes, um, but very much inspired by events that happened to my family that were adapted for her. So it's, it's, it's a hybrid is what it is. It's a piece of fiction um, that borrows from our personal experience as a family. Hmm. Ah, nice. And so I guess when we talk about stories of, of migration, are there any parts of the journey that you would not put in into a, a children's book? Like, are there, is there anything that you would not sort of put in or do you feel that the kids should be able to experience um, all the ups and downs of what it means to migrate to a new place? So, uh, you know, uh, I, I bro brought this up. It's one of the first things I said, actually. But the thing that I'm talking to a group of people at the moment who were, well, I'd call them um, uh, re refugees. Oh, here's a man with a five again. Oh, yeah. He's a man with a five. Yeah. <laughs> we just got five. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I've, I've performed to ten in the past. I just thought I'd tell you. Uh, and the people also have put up their phone numbers, which is great. Uh, what was I saying? Yeah, the kids. The people, a group of people I'm working with at the moment, who I'm talking to at the moment, who I want to write about, were children when they were displaced. Which is where I got this uh, uh, little fact from, uh, which is that we ran with our money and our cooking utensils because those are the two most important things in your life. The rest is rubbish. Yeah. And uh, so I'm talking to this group of people. Let's see where I go with that and whether I can do have enough meat in that, uh, uh, can garner enough meat. But then it will be more of a documentary as opposed to a story. Uh, if, if I was making a film, it would be a documentary film. If I was writing a book, it would probably be a document as opposed to uh, fiction. Nice. Thanks, John. So, um, Nadia, is there anything that you would sort of keep off limits or do you feel that the whole journey should be portrayed? No, I think... I'm not a fan of really sugarcoating anything for children. I think if we're talking about the refugee experience um, for a younger audience, I imagine who might be reading this book, and so what am I doing with it? What is my purpose with it? Well, one option is that it's going to be a child who has gone through a similar experience in his or her own life. And so if I sugarcoat it, that child is going to be like, this is wrong, this is not authentic, and it is, it's actually this way. And so they're not going to appreciate the story very much. If I'm writing it for a child who has not had that experience because he or she has had the privilege of being in one place and not having had been forced to move, well, then I'm doing a disservice to that child, too, who's actually picking up the story to learn, to understand, and to grow some empathy. And I'm not doing my job as an author. So, you know, I think there's something to be said about age appropriate, and you, you wouldn't, you know, use a lot of horrible language in a, in a book for children, and, and you'd be a little bit gentle. But the actual subject matter and the things that happen, I do believe we owe our children that service of being honest with what happens. Absolutely, and I like the way that you've actually put your adult book and then you've turned it into a kid's book, and I'm sure, I haven't read the book yet, but I'm sure you've retained most of that into the kid's version, so yeah. Uh, Kate, anything to add there? Yeah, I don't have much to add. Um, but I, I agree with Nadia that I think children have an incredible radar for inauthenticity. So if something doesn't, they, you know, smells fishy because it doesn't seem real, they will know. And they won't read the book. So, yeah. so I, I have um, one more question to ask, but I just I do want to give it out to the audience. So does anyone, anyone here will have a question or a statement that they want to say? Um, now is your chance. Anyone? We have a, a roving mic coming along. Yep, so... Okay, yep. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi, uh, yes. Yep. You hear me? Okay. 
So I'm a therapist uh, from uh, Bombay. I work in the mental health space with children and families uh, in different sections of the society that they come from. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, about migration and identity is about to think uh, it's not always about the moving from one place to the other physically. It's also about the sense of self that has a migration, especially when problems come in people's lives. It can be problems like a developmental disability, an accident, or some kind of a trauma or abuse. So even to think about migration of identity as something that happens because of a problem. And other one is also a comment to the speakers, is to think about, so as therapists and as mental health workers, we go through through this process of reflecting on our own privileges that, that shape our view of the world. Uh, so I think for uh, Deepak to think about when the victimization didn't happen to you, is, to, is that being lucky or is that uh, having privileges of certain sort that allows you to not have that? Because it's a lived experience of a lot of people to face that, what you did. So what allows somebody to not have that? So uh, it's to reflect about privileges that, uh, you know, allow people's migration of identity to sometimes be smoothly and feel home-like everywhere they go. And for some people to not feel home-like even if they want to. So, yeah. Um, would, would anyone like to respond to that? Um. Mm. Fabulous. Thank you for that. Yep. So I heard one of the introductions as a global citizen, and I, I wanted to wonder, do you think having a strong identity, which is important for mental health, and educators say identity is important, is that intention with being a global citizen? I mean, do these, do these, do, does having a strong identity of where you've come from and where you're going or what your roots are, it, does that sometimes, is it in, isn't it intention with being a global citizen? Maybe both of you can answer, maybe all of you. You know, I know that there are, um, uh, I think for, to tie in the mental health piece too, right? So uh, there are many people who I watch growing up around me and living around me in the United States who hold on very strongly to a, a, a cultural identity that comes from either the land of their childhood or their parents' childhood, right? And there are others who are very happy to let a lot of that go and transition to a more blended identity. Um, does that make them less global citizens? Maybe not. Maybe that makes them more global citizens because they're not holding on to one identity and they're more incorporating others. Or you know, people who are holding on to their identity but able to engage with others and introduce others to their own culture, there's, there's also a cultural exchange that's happening that way. So I think as long as we, we move through this world with the intention of engaging with each other, with uplifting each other's culture, finding room for tolerance, and building those bridges, then you know whatever you believe or build your own identity to be is okay. And I think any kind of forced identity, that's where people start to break down and, and wonder, you know, what, what should I be then? I agree pretty much all uh, with what you're saying, but you know, one, I'd just like to add one line that uh, identity often, I mean, you might go out to, to and be an outgoing, but identity is definitely defined by where you are at that particular moment. And if you let yourself be absorbed in that, uh, I think, I think you become that person, that identity, and it need not necessarily have anything to do with where you've come from. Uh, which, actually, I think a displaced person has far more advantages than somebody who is rooted in one place. I really think that, yeah. I think of identity as being a very fluid concept. Like, who am I? Like, sitting on this stage right now talking to you, I am an author. But I'm going to get in the taxi cab and go away from here, and the taxi driver will look at me and see me as a white person and as a woman. And I'm going to get it on the airplane, and I'm going to land back in Amsterdam, and then I'll be a mother and a wife. So I, I, for me, you know, I, I have an identity, but a lot of my identity is based on the labels that other people use when they look at me. Um, 
and, and so that's why I think, you know, it really depends. Your identity is so much based on the context that you, that you live in. And um, that's changing, of course. Um, I think, I hope, you know, in my country, in the United States, unfortunately, we have a very aggressive kind of uh, need right now to define us against others who are outside. Um, we think that gives us more sense of a strong national identity. And from my understanding, the same thing is happening in India as well. I think that's a real danger around the world. So my hope is that there will be, you know, a European identity, an Asian identity, a global identity that will actually connect us more than it divides us. Um, so that, that's a, a good way to actually uh, end this. And can I just say, this is the start of a dialogue. So please talk among, among yourselves about what it means to belong and what it means to have an identity, because with these books, it's not, not only is it about where you come from, but it's also where you're going to as well. And so what I love about reading is that it does give you hope, no matter how dire or no matter how tough the situation can be. So can we please have a round of applause for our panelists here, Kate, Naya, and Giant. Thank you so much. Those who are hungry or waiting to, waiting to grab a sweet bite with their tea. Okay, there are lots of books that have been made into movies, right? So I'm going to give you a bit of an explanation about the book or the movie, and let's see if you can guess. All right? It's a green book for kids by a classic kids author. It has a furry, earth-conscious character voiced by Danny DeVito and drives home the message of conserving our world for future generations. Think. It's right out there. Raghu, if you don't get this one, I'm taking all the chocolates that you want till now. Okay, I'm going to repeat it. It's a green book for kids by a classic kids author. It has a furry, earth-conscious character voiced by Danny DeVito and drives home the message of conserving our world for future generations. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, is it the Lorax? Yes, absolutely, it's Lorax. <laughs> Meave kids to the rescue. All right. Um, directed by Tim Burton, this is a new take on an old animated classic. Starring Johnny Depp, kids and parents alike will love following a girl. No, no. Kids and parents alike will love following a girl as she heads back to a place where she finally learns her true identity to end the Red Queen's reign for terror all at once. Alice in Wonderland. We don't have chocolates, but we have two more questions. Uh, <laughs> or uh, the winners can share. This animated Oscar-nominated movie brings this childhood favorite by Roald Dahl to life. Follow the hero as he attempts to pep up his boring home life by returning to his old life of chicken thievery. Little kids will love the talking animals, and parents will enjoy listening to the voice of George Clooney. Fantastic Mr. Fox. Yes. Fantastic Mr. Fox. A must-watch if you haven't seen it till now. Uh, the last one. This multi-part movie series based on the classic book follows the Pervasi siblings on their adventurous journey through Wonderland, where they are enlisted to help ward off evil advances of the Land's King and help restore order to the rightful heir. Let's give it to the drama teacher. Let's give it to... <laughs> Narnia. Yes, Narnia. And now to the next, our final session for the day. Okay, uh, we move to, uh, uh, to the last panel uh, session for today, Neve Litfest. Thank you once again on behalf of all of us here, Neve. Thank you very much for being here. We move to the last part of the day, humanity and nature. We live in a diverse world of complexities, uncertainties and challenges. Our differences make us unique and distinct. We are blessed with a beautiful blue planet which was once green, but today it is replaced by the concrete dense jungle where shades of brown are clearly visible. Modern technology owes an apology to ecology. It is not a fact which is to be debated, but it is a fact in reality. We humans are responsible for the sixth extinction, the continuous loss of massive animal and plant species since the ice ages 10,000 years ago and at the dawn of civilization. All of us are intimately connected to our natural environment. Our bodies are composed of water. We need clean air to breathe, 
and we need healthy and fertile soils to produce nutritious foods. Beyond that, nature has always been an inspiration and a beauty to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the next set of panelists. Deepak Dalal is a chemical engineer from Washington State University and holds a bachelor's degree in science and technology, chemistry and physics. His stories typically have a strong natural history base, the idea to create a connection between children and wildlife. For a year, Deepak taught in an international school in Macau, China. Based on his Andaman novels, he was selected to attend in 2000, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Highlights Children's Writers Conference in 2003 in the United States. He was honored by the Sanctuary Magazine in 2004 for increasing awareness of Indian children about wildlife and ecological causes. Deepak is currently working on two children's books, a dolphin's adventure story set in the Arabian Sea, and an illustrated series of books, the Feathers Tales series for younger children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chemical engineer turned author to Neve Academy, Deepak Dalal. अब मैं इस मंच पर जिन्हें आमंत्रित करने जा रही हूँ, उन्हें बचपन से ही प्रकृति से बहुत लगाव रहा है। उनका मानना है कि आज की पीढ़ी का प्रकृति से परिचय कराना बहुत जरूरी है, इसलिए उनकी अधिकतर किताबें वन्य जीवन संरक्षण और प्रकृति पर आधारित हैं। इनकी कुछ प्रमुख कहानियाँ हैं काली � जोरदार तालियों के साथ अभिनंदन कीजिए मद्रास क्रोकोडाइल पार्क की सह संस्थापक एवं निदेशक जय बटेकर जी का। Meet the poet, composer and academic Martin Kisko. He has composed over 200 scores for film and television and released nine soundtrack albums with major European orchestras. His score for the DreamWorks promo made for Steven Spielberg won the best music video at the Missoula Film Festival, United States. Martin also scored the soundtrack for the BAFTA-nominated movie, The Killing of John Lennon. As the UK's Green Poet, Martin has published Green Poems for a Blue Planet. Martin was poet in residence for Bristol European Green Capital throughout 2015 and has recently been awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Bristol in recognition of his poetry, music, and environmental work. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Martin Kisko. Our next guest is Patkatha Lekhak and the Little Rainmaker Kahani Ki Lekhika, Rupal Kevalia Ji. Rupal is a part of the form of the form of the form of the form. And for children, children, and some of the government institutions, gender sensitization, breaking stereotypes and creative thinking as well as the wishes of 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 the wishes. Rupal Kevalia. So, good afternoon everyone. And thank you for coming or staying on. I know these late afternoon sessions are tiring for everyone. And I have to also apologize for sounding like a frog. I have a bad throat, but that's probably a good environmental touch. Um, I'm delighted to be here with these wonderful writers. And um, I'd like to start sort of at the beginning, at the starting point, really. And <clears throat> ask for comments on the um, question of what actually is our starting point with children. Um, as readers, there's always a debate about, um, you know, one team says that the child is born with an intrinsic sensitivity to nature and that we as writers just build on it. And the other team says that we actually have to create that sensitivity and that it's becoming more and more difficult. So, Rupal, would you like to? So, uh, actually, I agree with both parts of your statement. I think when a child is born, uh, they don't have a sense of self. They, I, I personally believe they're born into this world with a connect 
to the nature because simply because they don't have a sense of the self so everything is an extension of themselves and just by that virtue they feel a connect to the nature but of course as they grow up let's say by two two and a half three when they actually start separating themselves and start seeing uh, everyone else around as the other and not uh, the self that's when the separation also begins and i think that's where a little bit of disconnect also begins uh, with nature but they are born into it and then it sort of separates and then it's up to us how to bring them back that's my two cents um, I'm, I'm a great fan of the romantic poets the romantic poets were around in the uk uh, in the 19th century and what the romantic poets said was that they said that they believed that children were born with an affinity to nature I think I believe that. I think I believe that too. And we do the damage as we go along to separate them uh, from the natural world. What the romantics also believed, and I think I would call myself a neo-romantic poet now, working in the 21st century, is what they believed was that what could reframe our attitudes to nature, and this is really what Sir David Attenborough believes as well, what can reframe our uh, attitudes to nature is education and making that reconnection to nature and the romantics believe for example that that could only come by using the inner child and the inner child is a thing that most of us manage to kill off by about the time that we get to 20 so I would say there has to be a reframing of attitudes built on resurrecting the inner child uh, to reconnect uh, as adults to nature well, I, you probably said what I want to say, but you know, it's very difficult with, uh, to maintain that connect with nature as children grow up. Because as we all know, we all children grow up in cities. When we take them on holidays, we take them to other cities. And in our cities, particularly in India, it's, the connect with nature is getting less and less. You can't because of concrete everywhere, all the gardens going away, all the just a few trees and nothing else out there. So it's obvious as the nature, the disconnect starts happening for kids. And really as educators, as uh, writers, part of our task is to rebuild that connect. Yeah, so the question is, how, does, how do you connect with nature when there's no nature around, really? And that is a challenge that we're facing in India. And certainly uh, one sees it more and more as a role that schools will have to play and are playing in <clears throat> some schools, for example, have started um, semester farms where students go and work on planting and harvesting crops uh, or they plant trees or whatever, but just the being able to be in a green place and get their <clears throat> hands dirty, feel the soil, climb a tree is much more important, I think, than uh, reading uh, chapters and chapters in your environmental textbook. And this is something that we, <clears throat> sorry, uh, at the Crocodile Bank, we have programs for students where they do a lot of hands-on husbandry and maintenance work. For example, Scrubbing the Galapagos tortoise is an activity that we um, have quite often. But a number of parents are so uncomfortable about their, parent, uh, about their children getting dirty and wet. And so that is also something that we need to address. Okay, I think, I think the key of it for me is this. Um, the great... North American conservationist Grey Owl said this, and I was discussing this with the children the other day. You belong to nature. You belong to nature, not it to you. Yeah? You belong, just think about that. You belong to nature, not it to you. Once you reframe your attitude to that, things have to work much differently. And I often say to the children, you know what it's like when one person loves another person. You know what it's like when you love your dog or you love your cat or you understand that relationship. That is exactly the same relationship that we need to have 
with the planet. And until we have that relationship, then I don't really believe we can fully reconnect with nature. Yeah, and the good news is really how little it takes, isn't it? Yes. One experience, one powerful experience with uh, nature is often all a child needs. Deepak, are you yeah. about to say something? Well, you know, carrying on from what, what you spoke about, how we have to educate children, schools have to step in. There's this wonderful saying by uh, this poet, a Senegalese poet, which he said that uh, in the end, we will preserve, in the end, we will preserve only what we love. And we will love only what we understand. And we will understand only what we are taught. You see the linkage. We will preserve only what we love. And that's true. We preserve only what we love. But what we love is only what we are taught. And what we... It's, that's the whole thing. It's, it comes down to that. You know, schools have to step in. We as writers have to step in. And we have to get that connect between kids and nature. Get them to love it. Get them for a reason to preserve it. That's what I, said. Uh, I also agree with uh, Zai when you said that we have to, better than reading from your environmental uh, sort of textbooks, we have to move out of that. Uh, because uh, a lot of school sessions that I have done uh, recently with my book, a uh, lot of answers that I got from the children were very uh, textbookish. You know, they were coming from their readers. They were saying the right things. And that's what's happening. We are all saying the right things. We are talking the talk, but we are not walking the talk. I think it's more important to go out and experience it rather than just reading. Uh, uh, and as a writer, yes, it's very difficult for me to say, don't read the books, just go out and, uh, you know, experience nature first. That's more important. Uh, just taking on from there, yeah. Yeah, I think as writers, we don't really want to say, uh, I know that I don't sometimes, you know, you don't want to say, okay, well, let's, let's forget about the books, you know, let's forget about educating uh, people. But, you know, again, one of the, romantic, the great romantic poets, William Wordsworth, who spent a lot of time in the, in the English countryside, in the, in the, in the lakes and uh, in uh, Tintern Abbey in Wales and wrote many, many uh, poems, uh, in that era, actually wrote a poem called The Tables Turned, where he said, just throw all the books away. <laughs> so, you know, uh, in a, TV steals time, television, it just steals your time, but nature amplifies it. You know, it demands all your senses, in the sense that if you're walking along, say, a coastline, you know, you, you hear the waves, you see the crabs, you see the fish, it demands your senses to be part of it, you know. And there are a lot of children who are the sort who, what I they know everything about, say, the Amazon rainforest. They know about the problems which are, I mean, which are all the endangered animals. But what about their connection with nature? Have they really gone there? When was the last time they went to the, to the sea? When did they go? Just simply lie in a field and stare at the clouds, or walk in a forest. It's hardly happening. Is that what we're losing that connect? Yeah, I wonder whether um, some of the parents who are here have anything to say. Because we're all living in cities and apartments. I think we're all here because we want to give our children that connect. So how do we do that in today's day and age? Can you, can somebody Give us some ideas on what you do with your children. Thank you. So uh, I would like to add on, uh, not, I'm not answering your question, what you have asked just now. I would like to add, just now you said, throw all your books and go close to the nature. What I will say or suggest, go close to the nature and there you read the book, smell the page and feel the nature. Well said. Thanks for speaking on behalf of us. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, to answer your question, uh, what could be the suggestion? Uh, 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 Ma'am, to answer your question as to what suggestions uh, people can give to you know, make children more aware about the nature. Uh, it's my 
a personal opinion that nature is shrinking because of wants are expanding. Uh, we want four buildings to ourselves. Uh, one for my child, one for myself, one for my wife, one for my uh, parent. And we want four cars because we have to move in four directions. So the nature has to shrink to accommodate our ever-expanding wants. Uh, I cannot really uh, point out how to tell our children, limit your wants, because this sounds too philosophical these days, that uh, the want should be limited because want has to be unlimited because they are available for us to realize. So possibly the education on environment could be more fruitful and probably result-oriented if we can educate first ourselves because it is one full generation of humanity that has captured the nature and made it very small for all of us. So first we educate ourselves, limit our wants, educate our children to limit their wants so that whatever nature is available to us now, it is for the children to use or live with when they grow up further. Uh, that's my suggestion, ma'am. I'm so glad you made that point because it's such an important point and I think that the parents role modeling this, like limiting their own resource use and making their own carbon footprint lighter is the best lesson for the children, isn't it? And we had this wonderful family from Bangalore coming to one of our programs at the Crocodile Bank. They do not have a car. They all use public transport. Uh, they really limit their water use. They're recycling water. They're doing all kinds of amazing things with the children. And those children are going to grow up into very, very uh, committed conservationists and spread the light around. So I think that's a very important point. It was just a question that does does being friendly with the environment, not having a car. I mean, Hobbes used to say that, you know, before the romantic poets, Hobbes used to say that lives were nasty, brutish, and short, right? Life expectancy was low. I mean, modern civilization may not be green, right? By definition, um, civilization is not green. <laughs> but human lives have gotten better than when we did live in forests and you know, stuff like that. I mean, it, we, there was a reason we moved from being hunter-gatherers to agriculture to urban stu and stuff like that. So, I mean, how do we reconcile this rather than sort of minimize modern civilization? That, that was my question to you. Is it, is it a conflict or is this a trade-off or is it just you have to not buy a car to... to I mean, we, I mean I, it, you, it, it just seems a high standard. Um, for, for human beings to say that put this modern civilization back, that, tooth, that train may have left the station or, or not really. So is, there a, is this a conflict? Is it a reconciliation? Is it a trade-off? At, at how do you think about the problem? I mean, I'm not asking about the solutions. Is this, is this in conflict or is this reconcilable? I mean, I personally don't see it as a black and white thing is that, you know, we have to all stop uh, using cars. Um, I mean, I'm certainly looking forward to the car that's going to drop me <laughs> to the... Uh, no, but um, it's more about giving the child a perspective as he grows up and think about... I mean, all of us could certainly do with less resource use. So I think it's a good idea as a family to discuss these things at least. You know, it should be a point of discussion and thinking in the family. And some people go the whole hog like this family, uh, you know, that came to us. But I think the important thing is a dialogue. And I think token things are very important. You know, I think in this whole environmental game as the children are growing up, tokenism is important. You know, once a week if you carpool instead of going in your own car, that is, I think, a very important thing to do for us. Um, also, I feel um, 
uh, children are growing up with that sense of entitlement, which is obviously passed on from the adults. You know, I especially see that up north where I belong. I, I'm from Delhi. And there, there is this complete sense of entitlement even on the roads, where the people are parking their cars or driving on the roads or even throwing garbage on the roads as if, you know, they own this space. So, like you said, yes, tokenism is important. I think we need to make these little, little choices every day. And that dialogue, to sit down as a family and discuss where we can limit our resources. Nobody needs to uh, stop using the car because we are not going to step backward now. We've already, like you said, moved much ahead. And we need to use uh, technology in so many ways. Uh, we don't need to go backward and discover the wheel once again. But definitely the sense of entitlement has to stop, that I own uh, this planet and I own this earth and I own the road that I'm walking on or driving on. So, yeah, I think little choices uh, go a long way. Yeah, I think it's, um, for me, it's a question of, of balance, really. Uh, I, I think uh, we all just have to make the contribution that we can make. I know that when I'm traveling around with my poetry show and the workshops and so on, all that I believe I am doing is planting seeds and giving prompts. I'm not dropping a 50-ton green weight on everybody's head saying, this is what I believe that you should be doing. It is really just prompting people to consider what their contribution uh, could be uh, to the environment. Having, having said that, you know, uh, and I know that I use a lot of humor uh, in what I do, the state of the planet is not um, a laughing matter. And of course, things have gone uh, a little bit haywire, and we, we, we're finding it difficult to pull the reins of, of the runaway horse back. Uh, and that, that is concerning and makes us think, well, perhaps we all need to kind of get stuck in a little bit more to help our children out the other end when their generation gets to where they are. And of course, there's the big caveat of technology will save us, like with intelligent buildings in, in Mexico City that convert smog into, into something um, less dangerous on the inside of the, uh, of the building, for example. But, you know, we've only got two of those buildings in the world or whatever, and how long is it going to take us to get to the point we need to get to? So it, it, it is that kind of strange balance of is a race against time, but at the same time, a lot of us can only do what we can, what we can do to, to in, 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 our, in our local area, for instance. Deepak. You know, it's a fact that the world's resources are limited, and we have to understand that. And uh, if everybody wanted to live like the people live, I mean, like how people have been living in the West, in the sense that the people who live in this, the huge populations that we have in Asia, the huge population that we have here, if we all want to have lots of cars, lead a kind of life which takes you everywhere, and you know, it's going to be difficult. It, it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to really, with our limited resources, it's not possible on this earth. Everybody wants to have caviar. Everybody wants to have uh, tuna fish. It's, you're going to cut into the resource. It's already happening. We've lost half of the, half of what the sea life which was there earlier, the biomass which is there in the sea, it's come down by half. And how long? Can you make cut it by another half? So, you know, we have to be careful of all our resources. They are limited, and we have to work within them. And the time has come to make these kind of decisions. Uh, also, to add to it, just because money can buy something does not mean we have to buy it. Uh, I think a lot of time we make the choice, just because I can afford it, let me buy it. Let's not do that, I think. Uh, let's make that a uh, very conscious choice. If I need it, let me do it. If not, then let's, let's give that up. It's okay. It's okay to not live with every single convenience that the planet has to offer and that you can buy it. There's one more question. From uh, what has been said so far, it seems that uh, books on en environment, am I audible? From what has been discussed so far with the panelist and the audience, uh, it seems that uh, books on environment can only do so much as maybe trigger a genuine con connection and understanding with nature, but ultimately it has to be done by the people with nature. 
Um, my question is not so much a question, but I'm wondering now, especially because one of you said that uh, we belong to nature and not uh, that nature belongs to us. What do you think uh, uh, about an anthropocentric view taken with respect to conserving nature? I mean, uh, if, if a lot of environmentalism and uh, things that we read around environmentalism come across as this is our earth or you know these are our plants and so we should conserve them or we should save them and here i thought uh, what got said in that statement as to we belong to nature and not nature belongs to us i feel this is not really in sync so i'm wondering if uh, uh, in our environmental books and i'm sorry i haven't read any especially the ones which are for children if uh, an anthropocentric view is there in, in them, and if you think that view is sustainable ultimately in the long run, if that will actually enable us to form a genuine connection with nature. You know, ideally we both belong to each other. <laughs> Let's agree with that. Uh, we are part of an ecosystem, but we made it as an ego system. Uh, you know, that's what, uh, like I was talking about that sense of entitlement. So we both belong to each other. It's a, it should be a mutual relationship of give and take. Nature has already done enough by giving. We are not giving back. And that is where the imbalance has come up. So yes, nature belongs to us. We belong to nature. We are all a part of this entire ecosystem. I don't think there is any complication or out of being out of sync in that. And please do buy the children's books on environment, all of us, and read them. <laughs> Okay, so I'm afraid I've been a very inefficient panel, uh, whatever it's called, because we only got through one question, but I think it was an important one and it kind of encompasses everything that we actually wanted to say. So thank you very much and let's be good citizens. Let's talk to our kids and let's make some decisions as families which is going to limit our resource use as a family. I think that's a, a, an important thing to do and it's also a very um, interesting thing that I've seen a lot of kids really, really engage with and enjoy. Thank you. Dosto, ab aap se vidha lene ka samay aa gaya hai aur aap se vidha lene se pehle Savdar Hashmi dwara likhit चंद पंक्तियां जो इस मौके के लिए बिल्कुल उपयुक्त हैं आपसे साझा करना चाहती हूं ध्यान से सुनिएगा किताबें करती हैं बातें बीते जमाने की दुनिया की इंसानों की आज की कल की एक एक पल की खुशियों की गमों की फूलों की बमों की जीत की हार की प्यार की मार की क्या तुम नहीं सुनोगे इन किताबों की बातें किताबें कुछ कहना चाहती हैं तुम्हारे पास रहना चाहती हैं किताबों में चिड़िया चह चाहती हैं किताबों में खेतियां लहा लहाती हैं किताबों में झरने गुनगुनाते हैं परियों के किस्से सुनाते हैं किताबों में रॉकेट का राज है किताबों में साइंस की आवाज़ है किताबों का कितना बड़ा संसार है किताबों में ज्ञान का भंडार है क्या तुम इस संसार में नहीं जाना चाहोगे किताबें कुछ कहना चाहती हैं तुम्हारे पास रहना चाहती हैं तो दोस्तों पढ़ते रहिए और अपने आस वालों को पढ़ने के लिए प्रेरित करते रहिए बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद when Miss Vinita started in the morning, she was worried about the television. She was like, yeah, television. I think when she's ended today, she's ended on a positive note. So let me read a few lines from Roald Dahl's television. Don't install a television at home. Why? Because it rots the sense in the head. It kills imagination dead. It clogs and clutters up the mind. It makes a child so dull and blind. He cannot lo no longer understand a fantasy, a fairy land. His brain becomes as soft as cheese. His powers of thinking rust and freeze. He cannot think. He only sees. How used to they keep themselves contented before this monster was invented? They used to. They used to. They used to read. They read and read and read and read and then proceed to read some more. Great Scots, Gadzocks. One half their lives was reading books. The nursery shelves held books galore. Books cluttered up the nursery floor and in the bedroom by the bed. More books are re waiting to be read. So, love to read, read to love, and come back again next time with more books in your bag. 
We have a beautiful performance, closing performance by the Natya and STEM Dance Company, which will be held in tent one from 6 to 7 p.m. So everybody is invited and welcome to join us and continue the celebration. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so everyone. Much. Thank you. Thank you.